table out of this room. <coughs> they had to get maintenance over here and disassemble the legs off of it to get it out the door. So it was quite a task, but it was worth it to be able to get more chairs in here and get everybody in with us today. So great turnout. We've got a few more seats here if you want to sit on the front row. <laughs> We got uh, is there somebody else still signing in? Okay, we'll give just another minute and we'll stop. Okay, well good evening. For those of y'all that's not been here before, I'm Commissioner Shannon Whitfield. This is a great turnout. This is one of our required public meetings that we have to have anytime we have a village rate change. The state law requires that we have three public meetings, but due to uh, sensitivity of the issue being first time in my administration and wanting to make sure everybody had access, we decided to have five public meetings. We had two extra. Uh, we had one in Rossville, we had one two at the Civic Center, we actually did one this past Saturday. One of those two at the Civic Center was on a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. So they were very informative, very well attended. We averaged over 50 people at each and every meeting. I think we got about 54 chairs out here today, so it looks like we're uh, probably got about 40 plus people in here, closer to 50 tonight. So again, appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to, here in just a moment, we're going to have our public hearing, but we're going to have the place of the flag and also the prayer. And then once we do that, we're going to talk first of all about our public safety fee. It's been previously known as the fire fee. And uh, Assistant Chief Paul Lender is going to speak here tonight. To, uh, Chief Blake Hodge, some of you there's other means. He's still with us. We didn't fire him. He uh, had to go to some training, some required training that he had already prepaid for, and so he left out about midday yesterday to go to that training. So uh, Assistant Chief Linder is going to fill in for him and go over and explain the public safety fee. He's got uh, probably about a dozen slides or so that he's going to go through with the PowerPoint. Once he goes through those slides, then we're going to open up the floor for questions and comments. And then once those are finished, then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to go through a little bit of the audit information, some of the taxing things. And then once we finish the public hearing side of that, we'll adjourn that and then we'll go into our regular monthly meeting where we'll take action on the items that you see in the agenda. But we'll have to close the public meeting. So when we close the public meeting, don't think it's over and try to leave on us unless you need to go. We'll be open back up into our regular scheduled meetings so we can officially take action on those items. Everybody good for that? <coughs> All right. So the first item on our agenda is the invitation, correct? So if you'll bow with me, that'll lead us to the work prayer. <coughs> hey, Father, we just thank you for a great week. Lord, just thank you for a fantastic turnout here tonight. Lord, it's uh, refreshing to me to see this type of turnout and to see that people are truly concerned about the future of our county and that they want to be involved and they want to plug in and understand and be a part of the solution. Lord, I just appreciate each of them being here. Lord, we just pray for your blessing on this meeting and most importantly, Lord, we just ask you for the, the guidance to, uh, to lead us forward and Lord, just help us to, to deal and understand and make the right decisions about the issues that are facing us with our county that seem overwhelming. Lord, we know you're in control. We know we can turn this all over to you tonight and that you will guide us through this. And Lord, uh, just be with those that are unable to be here with us. Lord, just give us safe travel home. And Lord, just give us a great meeting and a great evening tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you'll stand with me, we're going to place to the Georgia flag first. I pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag.
other ones. A few more seats, we can squeeze everybody in. We've got a few more coming in. Okay. Um, this time, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Paul Linder, who's our assistant chief. As we indicated, he's going to come up and talk to you about the public safety fee. If you'll hold your questions to the end, most likely about half the questions that you may have, he's going to cover in the presentation. So if he doesn't cover your question or concern, he'll take those at the end. So Mr. Lander, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. Being the pinch hitter, I'm the guy that usually is behind the curtain. Keep the, gear, the gears turned, the move, and keep the wheels going. So y'all bear with me, okay? Um, the fire department, what I want to do first is tell you who we are. We're made up of about 18 stations throughout the county. As you know, we cover over 460 square miles. Um, right now, we have 50 career firefighters, and we have 50 volunteer firefighters. Uh, if you see one of our volunteers, please pat them on the back, shake their hand, hug their neck, thank them for what they do, because we really appreciate them. They help us tremendously. If you would like to volunteer, we are recruiting daily. We have a package you can fill out at headquarters. We can tell you what's the ins and outs. The old saying is you volunteer, or you volunteer to, to take a job after that, there are requirements. So um, if you've got family or friends that might be interested, please, 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 have them come see us. Okay, a lot of departments, a lot of times fire departments, people just think all you do is firefight. No matter, sir, that's not all we do. We respond to any emergency that law enforcement doesn't. Now think about that. If it doesn't do with law enforcement, the fire department is usually responding to it. Structure fires, of course. Residential and commercial industry can take care of that. Medical calls, CPR in progress, respiratory distress, chest pains, anything that's life-threatening, the fire department will respond. And in the past, we've been using the big trucks. Uh, when Chief Hodge came on board, he evaluated everything, and he saw that our trucks were aging, and that uh, they use a lot of fuel, and that he wanted to make a difference. So he started with the QRV. We'll get into that just a little bit. I'll show you the difference between those. Hazardous materials calls, so if you don't have that many, well, LP gas tank leaking a little fuel, you smell it, we get the call. We gotta go mitigate that. Uh, fire medical alarms. Uh, we do do quite a few of those. Again, gas leaks that should fall from hazardous materials. Lift assist. Your mother, your father, your cousin, uncle, whoever, they fall out of the chair, they, they, they slip and fall in the bathtub, we're the ones who get the call. We get there and evaluate them. <coughs> they say there's nothing wrong with them to 911, we're still going to go and help lift them up and get them out. And then we'll evaluate them medically. Trees down. My wife, like any other firefighter, his wife has to listen to the tones. A drop of rain can hit the ground, and she'll say, stop to go off. We're the tree down capital of the world, I believe. <laughs> we run a lot of trees, and we don't mind doing that because it keeps our roadways open for you, for our fire apparatus, and also for law enforcement and ambulances to get to the emergencies. Technical rescue, we have a cave and tip cliff team. It is comprised mostly of volunteers. Uh, they have been around for decades. They are world renowned, and I mean that sincerely. They have written books. Uh, they are the guru of Cave and Cliff Rescue. Uh, fire prevention and education. We've had fire marshal, I believe, since 1997. Uh, uh, say, well, what do you need fire prevention for? When I was a child in elementary school, <clears throat> went to Class 3 Elementary. I remember the fire marshal coming to our school. You got a pencil, you got a home escape sheet, and a little Debbie. You yeah. think, well, that's all you're doing? No, we're teaching your children what to do in case of a fire, how to escape their home, what to do if the post catches on fire. So a lot of things that we do do for, for the public on that part. We do do fire inspections for the schools to remain, make sure that they're safe. Uh, somewhere in the near future, we're going to start doing our local businesses. And you say, well, is that just not, what are you doing? That for? Well, make sure the exits are open so that you can get out safe. Help them where they don't have a fire. We may find something they've overlooked. It helps them, helps them take care of their businesses. Fire investigation, as you wonder, a lot of people say, why are you wearing a gun and a badge? 
Along with arson investigators as well. So that's, there's three of us that do that. So. <clears throat> Public education. This is something we miss that we definitely want to get the, the subject out there. Your church, your school, we want to come see you. We teach CPR. We teach first aid. Um, we'll even come in and inspect your home if you'd like us to to help you there. There's a lot of things that we, we like to do, but we can't go out and ask you if you want to look at your house. you got to call us. Have us come in. Uh, if your church is having an event, invite us. We, we can do all kinds of things for them there. All kinds of fire safety programs. Your fire prevention education is five bonus points in your ISO. You said, well, what's ISO important for? We'll get to that. ISO is your insurance service office. Um, if there wasn't an ISO, they would require you to have insurance. Okay? They're the ones that go out here and look at the standards. They're the ones that want your home safe. You know, a lot of people say, well, my insurance company doesn't do anything but give me havoc. Well, they're protecting their assets, just as you should be. I want my assets to go on to my children, and so on and so on. So, in so, they make us make sure that you're safe. In our personnel, they count how many people we have responding and how quick we can get to your location. Uh, NFPA is another standard that we have to meet. Uh, 1710 requires us to be there to get so many men or women at your location within so many minutes. So that's something else we have to keep up with. But look at our training. How proficient are we at what we do? Uh, fire hydrant testing and maintenance. How many of you see a fire truck out testing a fire hydrant? Everybody's hand ought to go up. You see that all the time. We're checking that to make sure the hydrants operate and that they can <coughs> the flow to make sure your, your house if it catches on fire, Lord forbid, we've got the water we need. Improving response time. I'll get into that in just a little bit, a little bit deeper. Pre-incident plans. We go to our businesses and we let draw a map and location of, of the business, the inside of it. So well, why is that? Our firefighters need to remain safe. Uh, there's hazardous material in different businesses. We need to know where those are at. So we have these pre-plan books and all the chief's vehicles. Every engine in QRV has a book of their immediate territory so that they can look at those when they need it. But ISO judges us on all these things. There's, five, there's 10 classes. You go from class 1 to 10. 1 being the best, the very best. 10 being the least. 10 is you don't have a fire department. It doesn't exist. And what I want you to look at, this is the state of Georgia. Out of, in Georgia, there's 1,038 communities. We are the top 7% in the state of Georgia. We fall in a class 33. There's 56 class 3 fire departments in the state. And I think that's outstanding for our community. Nationally, it even gets better. There are 47,242 communities throughout the nation. We are in the top 5% of that. Class 3, there's 1,998 fire departments that are Class 3. Walker County, Georgia is one of those. Okay. When Chief Hodge was looking at the responses, he was looking at what we run the most of. Now, for the big engines, uh, The big engines, they carry 1,000 to 1,200 gallons of water, and they can pump up to 1,500 gallons a minute. It's a lot of water to move. But we don't need those on every, every call that we go on, like we talked about. We only run 2% of the structure fires, is, is what our time is uh, tied up with. Fires and other fi uh, incidents with fire is like car fires, brush fires, those type of incidents. 89% or almost 90% our medical calls, trees down, and those type of events. That's why we went to the QRVs. Chief Hodge has a question. I hate to keep saying Chief Hodge, but that's who put this plan together. He always asked the command staff, what is the greater good? It's what's doing right by the majority. You be clear, the citizens of Walker County, the majority of the time. Now, if we back up, 
90% of what our calls could be handled by the QRV. The trucks, is there a picture of the trucks in here somewhere? Good. Somewhere. Come I believe it's after that. I apologize. Sorry, the maps. But the greater good is to get to you as close as we can. Time is the only thing we can't control. So we have to stay as quick as we can on our responses. Right now, or before the commissioner, the first year, we had three stations that were career staff. Station one in Rock Springs, station six in uh, Chickamauga, and then station 11, which is just on the back side of Lafayette, city of Lafayette. At that time, we were under a safer grant. And Chief Camp had to have personnel in so many locations and staff the trucks that are very known, which was, I think, the 343 that we had to staff them at. We were past the safer grant. Uh, so we can staff how we're going to change. I'll show you in a second. This is what we call a Class A pumper. It carries 1,000 gallons plus. Like I said, the pump is, has the possibility of pushing up to 1,500 gallons per minute. These trucks get about anywhere from two to four gallons a mile. A mile, a mile. Huh? Four, yeah. Two to four miles a gallon. Sorry about that, guys. This is our QRVs. They're, le they're less on the maintenance. Go back on the big trucks. This is a 2009. We haven't bought any new equipment since 2009. Uh, this truck right here, we were running them all over the place. Remember I said, Walker County is 460 square miles plus. This truck was running from east to west, north to south. Uh, it's got about 107,000 miles on it. Just the 2009. The QRVs were basically bought for a truck, <coughs> a brush truck back in 2002. They sit in the station and were rarely used. The uh, mileage on those were roughly between 10 and uh, 12,000 miles. Now, granted, they're washed and waxed. They look brand new. They are brand new because they've got very little mileage on them. So we outfitted them with EMS equipment, put a little bit more hose on, uh, chainsaws. It can handle just about any any response we have in that 90 percent tile uh, response. This is giving you the difference of the size. It's basically an F550 versus a fire truck. Our expansion program, back in July 1st, we put into effect Station 2. We picked it because it had the less amount of uh, construction that had to be done to get the crews in there fast. Um, the response times, remember that, Station 2, our response times from our career stations at the time was they were from 12 to 14 minutes. Now think about someone that's had a heart attack. A fire will double in its size every minute. So time, like I said, is our biggest obstacle. But Station 2, once it was put into operation in July 1st, went from 12 minutes to 6 minute response times on average, the numbers that were full. We're getting to you twice as quick. So after we looked at that model, we said, well, I think we can do better all, all the way across the county because do the greater good for the majority, the majority of the time. It's for you. So what will we do on October 1st? We have a Station 20, which is at our headquarters at Alex Drive, right off of 136. Station 15, down the Cane Creek area, will be opened up to full time. Station 14 is over in Villa now. Now the response times to 15 went up. They were about 15 to 16 minute response times from our career, okay? Over in Villa now, our response time was about 25 minutes plus. But having career personnel in there, we'll be able to cut those times, not even in half, but more than that. Because at 14, having career people there, we can get them between six to eight minutes. That's a big difference, a large difference. When we get on the scene, we have a high, high percentage of fire. Um, we, it takes us longer to control it, and more is lost. But if we can get on the scene when it's just a kitchen fire or a couple room of contents, we can make a big difference there, and that's what we're looking for. We're, we're combating the time. With our expanded coverage, here's what we get.
those, are, those response times are going to be drastically reduced. It increases the opportunity to save lots of property, like we said. You know, you say, well, my house burnt and 50% of it was gone. What did you say? Well, personally, I have pictures that can't be replaced. I have furniture in my home that has been passed down from family that can't be replaced. If I can save just one of those things for you, <coughs> you feel like I'm making a difference in your life. That's what we're here for. It saves on fuel and maintenance. The big trucks, like I said, two to four miles a gallon. The tires on those things are anywhere from five to hundred to a thousand dollars a piece. The uh, the maintenance on them, due to the, uh, the high mileage, as you know, they start breaking down sooner and longer. Community relations. I've been with Walker County since 2007. Like I said, I'm the guy that's behind the curtain making everything go and move. When our crews would go to the store, the commissioner would get calls. What are our firemen doing at the store? They're getting food. They gotta eat. But we want to be out there with you. If you're there and you have your grandchild or your child with you, say, hey, there's the fireman. We'll go out and show them the truck. We'll talk to you about fire safety. We'll shake your hand. We want to be there for you. We want to be seen. We want to be part of the community. We are part of the community. Most of our staff lives in Walker County. We are part of you. ISO duties, <clears throat> like I said, the big trucks were going from north to south, to south to west, back and forth doing these ISO duties, doing the hydrants, doing the free plans, all the things we talked about. Well, now our QRVs will take care of that. Reduce the maintenance, reduce the fuel cost, and they're already in the areas that have to be done. Instead of going from Rock Springs all the way over to Bell now, we've got to do that take care of that. And vice versa, all throughout the community. A very important step here in the automatic aid agreements for the neighboring departments. Uh, we have one with the city of Oak we have one with Catoosa County, we have one with Rossville, Woodfield County is coming up. We're working with them because over in the Middle Now area, they have a station that's within five miles of our county line. So our crew and their crew can work hand in hand until we get some support uh, staff to them. But it's very important. What happens is we have a large fire. We have basically, we get about 20, 25 rough personnel on the scene. It empties our stations. So we have our automatic aid rooms with the other departments. They'll come in and what we call backfill. They'll be tru bring trucks into our county, provide services, and then we get off the fire that we're on. <coughs> okay, the public safety fee. I'm up front, I'm not the numbers guy. Chief Hodge is the numbers guy. But I'll give you what I've got. And I'll try to pay, 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 give, give you what you can. He wanted to base it, the fire fee, <clears throat> we'll go back a little bit further than he did. Help, helps me understand, help you understand. I've been in the fire service since 1980. Okay? I was a post volunteer. I've been serving Walker County for 35 plus years. They sold subscriptions. I was sharing with this gentleman here earlier. They sold subscriptions. If you didn't have a subscription, they wouldn't go. And their house, your house would burn down. I wasn't one of those guys. We did what our chief did. <coughs> but when the subscriptions, they would bill the insurance companies if you didn't have a subscription, they did go. So we went from that era into the government service era. The, Fire fee was initiated, and so much funding was, was given. But it wasn't enough to have to keep dipping into the general fund. Um, anyway, when Chief Hodge got here, he kept looking at it. He said, $130, a house that's 800 square foot versus a house that's 4,000 square feet, that's not equitable. They're not, they're not paying for the same thing. You've got a bigger house, it's going to take more resources. A smaller house, it's going to take less. Let's go a bit further into that. But it's based on the square footage for the needed fire flow. And what we do is the length time the width tells us how many gallons of water it's going to take to extinguish that. The, uh, and that's basically how the square footage on the public safety fee was originated. How many numbers of firefighters is it going to take to extinguish the fire? How much equipment is it going to take? How many hours of work? Here's an example. We have a 900 square foot mobile home. 
And by the way, some people had a couple calls today. Chief Hodge called me. Somebody had told him we have more mobile home fires than we do house fires. Well, we went back and looked at our statistics, our numbers. 20% of our structure fires are mobile homes. The rest of them are residential structures. But the mobile home, 900 square feet, it takes approximately eight firefighters, three engines, a tanker, a tanker with a truck that carries water, one command vehicle, and roughly less than two hours of work. The 4,000 square foot home with a basement, and these are actual calls we've had. Took us not, took not 29 firefighters, 11 engines, four tankers, three command vehicles. We had to bring each lady in to help us move, move water. And we had the CERT team, which is another volunteer organization in our, our county as well. They had the people that have the bus and bring us rehab. We couldn't keep operating without them guys. We appreciate them. It took approximately eight hours to bring that incident and to mitigate it back to where it was safe. So you can see the difference on the square footage and how much time it takes. So I said, what if there was no fire department? Well, if there was no fire department, you call 911, nobody's coming. Nobody's going to respond. Mm -hmm. And Bishop and I are going to try to stretch it when it comes to the number department. We'll need your help on this. The way I understand this, we have 22,000 rooftops. Is that correct? With the insurance, Chief Hodge called his insurance. And the insurance agent, he asked her, said, what would it cost me if I did not have fire protection? She called back a few hours, an hour later, she said, you really don't want to hear this. He said, yes, I do, I need the numbers. She said, it would cost you right out $1,500 increase of what it's already paid. Well, 22,000 square, uh, 22,000 rooftops, that equates roughly, I think on the median was a thousand dollar increase, is what they figured, so You're looking at a 22,000 <coughs> increase in which you've already paid in county -wide. But with the fire department, with your class three that we present to you, you get a large reduction of that. Okay, that makes sense? That is the brief, the hop and the skip of it. Chief Hodge can give you the numbers. Let me say this to you. If you've got any questions or you've got any, any particulars that you want to go over on our operations, his door is always open. Our, our phone calls are always answered. We'll set an appointment up and show you anything or give you anything that you want to see. Just like the commissioner says, he's, trying, he's transparent. We are as well. There's nothing to hide in our department. You want to go look at all the vehicles? I'll personally take you around and take you to every station you can look at. We don't have anything new. We are surviving with what we've got. We're taking very good care of it. We're trying to take and squeeze every dollar we can out of the budget. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. You didn't use your day count. Does it have an agreement to help? It does. And without them, right now, we're, we're hurting the volunteers up on the mountain. Okay. Yes, ma'am. North, North Dade helps us out. New Salem helps us out. Uh, and we help them out as well. But yes, we do have mutual agreements with them. Yes, yes, sir. I disagree on a couple of things. Your percentage on the higher footage on it, the man that's got the 4,000 square foot house is paying more taxes than the guy that's got 1,000 square foot house. But he's getting the same services and everything. So that right there, he. He's paying more in both ways. If you get me more on fire, and you get more on taxes on it, it there's more in it. Now, the vehicles, as you're talking about the fire trucks, they're usually around 300,000 mile vehicle on that diesel. On the and I know it's not economically fuel efficient. Those F 150s are excellent on it for what you're using them for. They basically got a 300,000 mile on the motor, too, if they're maintained on it. So there's a lot of things through there that I kind of don't agree with. And your areas, you didn't do one thing on your population for fire, you know, on it. The areas that's got more housing should have more fire departments. You've got more chance for bigger fire departments. And you've got a couple of areas here, like, uh, I can't see them good, but it's like 18 and 12 and all of them, there's not a lot of companies there. 
we really should have a total chart of the population because when the houses are closer together, you're going to have more chance of more fire damage and everything. And like when you were saying you was from the post fire department and everything, when the $20 fire fee, I used to pay it too and you go up there, they would respond to the fire, but they would watch it burn because that was it. And, you know, that was the policy back then. It went from 40, 50 to what it is today and that we don't have it from our taxes and all that. But uh, I think a lot of it, we need, in the conditions we're under right now, we need to tighten up the belt on it and, uh, to get out of this mess and then do some expansions of stuff. You know, because taxes are high. <coughs> I know you need it. And what you said basically about the fire trucks responding to people that are having heart attacks or anything like this, that's great. You do a good job on that. But we need in the highly areas that it's, it's not fair what I'm going to say, but there's more chance of that in an area where there's a bunch of people than out in the farm areas. And those people are just as important in every time we get. Uh, that's one thing I'd like to see right here. But, and everybody here is probably going to look on the taxes, but we're in the mess. And we've got to figure out how to dig out. Right? Let me see if I can cover everything she's asked. <laughs> If I forget something, let well, me know. I'll, I'll give everybody's to questions answered. Number one, your fire fee that's been in the past, up to 2016, by state statute, it's supposed to cover 100% of your fire operation and not use your property taxes at all. Because you've got four out of the five cities that are not participating in the fire service for the county. <coughs> City of Chickamauga is the <coughs> So the previous administration, once again, was not doing everything like they should be doing. That's for sure. And so what we're trying to do is fix it. <coughs> so yes, this public safety fee based off square footage will generate a little bit more income overall. But it's going to be paying for more things than just the fire department. It's going to cover our, EM, our emergency management program. It's also going to be covering our subsidy that we have to pay the puck at EMS every year, which is $250,000. The fire department, in their defense, when we look at what was actually spent in 2016 for the fire department, I reduced their 2018 budget by $50,000. And so, guys, you're going to work more efficient, leaner, and you're going to six stations per your proposal for $50,000 less in money. And so we've not hired any staff. We've not bought any trucks. We've bought very little equipment. And some of the supplies that we need to get them to be even better at first responding to medical calls, we need $7,000 in supplies that are being donated to us. And so, when Chief Hodge came in January 1st, one of the first people that I hired, I said, go through the department, go through the system, unturn all the rocks. There's nothing sacred. Figure out what we got to do to get this thing where it needs to be. And so everything that we have changed this year is what I call has come from the bottom up. Chief Hodge and his staff and his command team have gone through all of this stuff. They vetted this stuff out. And I've not been involved in any of those meetings. The first day Chief Hodge started on the job, I met with the command staff, and that's my last time I've met with the command staff, was to introduce Chief Hodge officially. What we've asked them to do is to look at where reality is, look at the call volume, the types of calls, where they're located, where we're positioned. And you've got to remember, You've had three full-time stations, and you had four career firemen in four stations. It's a lot of comfort there. They get a lift assist call, they send a big truck, four men go. Trees down, four men go. Big truck, four men. So they get in that comfort zone. Now each one of these stations <coughs> are going to have two people in them. Okay? And out of the 18 stations, they're being positioned based off of call volume, which is affected by population. It is affected by rooftops. 
But we've not just thrown a dart at the map and say, well, here, or this is closer to so-and-so's home or whatever. Chief Hodge and his team has spent the time to go through the 911 database and go, okay, list what makes sense. And he's very serious about saving lives. So every minute that they can cut off of that response time is what they're after. So how do we take $50,000 less money and deliver all of you better service? That's the objective. And so we did a test over in Flintstone, Station 2. <laughs> In that station too, right? Yes. Before, if you had an emergency call, they're going to dispatch either from Chickamauga or from Rock Springs. And 15, 16 minutes later, they're going to roll up and you're going to probably have already called 911 back at least once. Where are they at? Where are they at? Where are they at? Because when you've got a fire emergency, a minute, five minutes seems like a long time. When they get a call to go to Villanelle, same thing. It's 25 minutes. So if they're on a call in Rossville, they get a call in Villa now, then they've got to send another station or another truck even further. So we've got response times that are over 30 minutes in some cases. So I'm all with you. I'm a numbers person as well. We are cutting overhead. And once we get further into the conversation, you'll see more of that. But the new budget that they'll be under is $3.4 million for their budget. It's $50,000 less than they had last year. They will have to work within that budget, and zero dollars of that is coming out of the general fund. Zero dollars is being paid by property taxes, being paid by the public safety fee, along with the EMA and the budget. So I also remember the days when my parents would go out on the front porch and volunteers would come by and they would say, we're here to renew your subscription. At that time, it was probably almost 100% volunteer. Nationwide, the volunteer <coughs> as a whole is over 50% now because everybody are busier. People are not as committed to volunteering as they used to be. Working two jobs to survive. Both spouses are working or juggling kids or juggling ball schedules. All of that's going on. So we have been begging for volunteers. They're doing things in the school systems. They're doing recruitment. We've got a thing coming up in a couple of weeks we're going to do at the Ag Festival to do more awareness and do recruiting, both for paid staff and volunteer staff. The days of volunteer staffing is dwindling. And what will happen over time, I'd say 10 years nationwide, you probably won't have any volunteer staff, which is going to take more money to fill that void. We are extremely dependent on our volunteers. And it would be even more difficult to do what they do without them because 50% of their headcount is volunteer. That's a very, very big number. It's very critical that we maintain those and grow that database. Another thing, when you go to, like he said, you volunteer and then there's a level of commitment and training. These people have to be trained more from the medical side because 90% of the calls has nothing to do with fire. And so it's a dynamic that's changing in our marketplace. We're an aging population. We have better resources and capability of life-saving equipment from inventions and things. We need more of that type of equipment on our trucks because houses are built better, wiring's better, more buildings with fire suppression systems, more people are more aware about fire safety, you're going to see your fire numbers go down. And we're going to also start the first of the year more of a fire pre prevention proactive stance on commercial buildings where these guys are going to go out and individually inspect public buildings, all of them can. So we started internally first. We started inspecting this month the county buildings. And we've had a lot of wake-up calls. We've got a lot of surprises. We've got a lot of fire hazards in our county buildings. The fire extinguishers in this building had not been touched, inspected, or tagged in 10 years. You're supposed to be every year. Every year. And then you look the date underneath it to tell if it's been hot or other. That's right. It's been <coughs> tested. So there's other procedures that's got to be done. It's been 10 years since a fire extinguisher in this building had been touched. So we're not going out in the community and, you know, and tapping everybody else on the hand and say, wake up, check your fire extinguishers. We're starting internally first. We're going to get all the county buildings up to par so we don't have any fires. 
And then we're going to go out, and it's not going to be we're coming in with a stick. We're here to help you. As Chief Hodge tells you, we'll do more good in fire prevention than we'll ever say you're trying to put the fire out. We can prevent it from ever happening. So we want to see our fire numbers go down even more. This year, the fire department has responded to about 3,500 calls last year. And on the pace that they're on now, they'll go over 4,000 calls. So when you've got that type of call volume and you're trying to do it with volunteers, they just can't respond enough. They're having to work jobs and everything else too. What else did I miss? I don't know what I got. I'll go back up and show the other. But, you know, there's, you know, talk about the coverage map. The coverage map may be all changing. You know, if we see shifts in call volume, we see shifts in population, we can change that around. And hopefully over time we'll be able to add even more staff possibly if, if we get the income and the revenue by more development, more houses being built, more growth will generate more revenue just by the natural growth of that. And so, you know, I would love, I know the fire department would love to have staff in all, in all stations. But, but when this county has been managed for 16 years with three full-time stations and large pockets just so they can have everybody at three stations. Yes, he, he brought up about, and I'll take to, for instance, in my area. I've got a building that's 15 by 25, for chicken, my little chickens, okay? I'm going to be assessed 10 cents per square foot. Now, across the road from me is a rodeo arena, and the thing is probably 150 wide, 200 and some feet long. $400 is all that he'll pay for that. I'm paying, you know, 40 or 50, 90 dollars is the minimum, it says here, for a structure. Well, that just isn't quite right, because... Well, it's not per structure. Yeah. Well, what it is, is, if you've got a partial... Okay, that's what okay. I want to know. If you, if basically, let's talk residential for this sake. You've got just residential. Right. You might have an outbuilding, you might have a shed, you might have a carport. The square footage is based off of what the assessor's office has, is your heated square feet. Okay, for my house. For your house. Now what about my agricultural structures? On the agriculture, if you've got multiple structures, it's a max of four hundred dollars for your partial total. For the agricultural structure. Whatever's on that partial. So if you've got a house, if you've got a house on that partial. It's gotta be some agriculture. Yeah, it depends on well how it's used, right? That's classified at the assessor's office. So basically, on the on the schedule, when you look at it, you're going to max out at, at $400, I think, on both the agriculture and residential boat. So you can have multiple chicken houses. We had some folks come on Saturday, and they've got like six chicken houses. Right. Well, they're listed as agriculture. They're going to max out $400. And if you go back and look at some of these bills, most of them were paying about that or a little more. Some people got a decrease, some people got an increase. With this rate change, there's 10,000 properties that got a decrease, where it went from $130 and went down. There's 11,000 that went up. So before, it wasn't fair or equitable because somebody in a 1,000 square foot home paid the same as a 5,000. That, that's not equitable at all. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to make it more fair. Is this perfect? No, it's not. Can we can we tweak it over time and do and get it better? Absolutely. But, but to go from what's been in place for since '94, and this is our first change, you know, I think we've made some great improvements. But if he's talking about what it takes the number of fire engines. Let's say a chicken house goes on fire, and they're all next to door to each other. That's going to cost you a way or more than what that house did. So when that is a commercial adventure, and we're going to provide a service that you know you can burn, they can all burn down, and you can spend days out. Yeah, there. it's not a perfect system, yeah. and agriculture is probably one over this next year we need to study and probably make yeah. some tweaks to. And we're very open to that. Yeah. And once the tax bills go out and we get this in the market, we're probably going to learn some other things. But 
I guarantee you there was a lot of time put in by the staff to go through this and the assessor's office has been fantastic to work with. We've had several meetings also in conjunction with the uh, tax commissioner's office and staff trying to figure this out to try to make it better to raise a little bit more revenue to cover more things to take the burden off the general fund so the property taxes didn't have to go up any more than a year. Who's next? Yes, sir. You mentioned that we're paying $250,000 to Puckett. Yes, sir. I thought we were paying the sole Puckett to Amber Service and why we pay them? They had to pay them a supplement. They did sell them the equipment, but it's very common. I know Catoosa County pays Angel a supplement, but there's so much indigent type care. There's so many times that they'll be dispatched, they don't get paid anything. And so it's pretty common. When you privatize, the county's responsible to provide that coverage and that service. It's one of the requirements. And so if we sub that out, we're having to supplement them to get them to do that. And they put that out for bid in the previous administration selected pocket. And they're under contract, I think it was three years? Five. Five years. So they're under contract for that subsidy. How close do I get that five years up? About two years or two? Two years. I think that for the county would be better off take it back. If the fire service is going to be answering these calls to assist people and all that stuff, I think the county should take it back. I mean, it's something that in five years, if I'm still here, we will definitely evaluate. We'll see what happens with health care. Because the, the, the big deal changer, if everybody in America become insured some way, somehow, or fashion, if everybody had insurance, so you knew every time an ambulance call went out, whoever showed up was going to get paid. That's a deal changer. But the reason the county give it up is because they were losing money with it. The way it was managing it, the recovery from insurance payments, it was a big money drainer. And once again, they were taking several millions of dollars a year out of the general fund to subsidize it. So to cut off that expense to keep from spending millions, I think one of the audits that showed they wrote off like 5.8 million. To cut that off, Sell it out and give two hundred fifty dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars to be done with it, and that's what they do. And at the time, that's probably the right decision. Yeah, one of them, okay. probably one of the better things. To do. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm I'm a little confused. That public safety pay is that on top of the fire protection we pay? No, it's being fire? replaced. You've been if you're residential, you've been paying one hundred thirty dollars. This is replacing that. So if you have a 1,200, say, square foot house or mobile home, you're going to pay 120. Anything 1,300 square <coughs> feet or less is going to get a reduction. And there's 10,000 of those out there. The but minimum is $90. Anything, anything larger is going to be more. Going to be more up to $400 is the cap. Up to 4,000 square feet will be the cap. That includes uh, what storage buildings you might have? It's heated square footage. Okay. So it doesn't include your storage buildings. Heated square footage. And it doesn't include the porches or garages? Or yeah. the porches or garages or anything like that. It's your actual heated living space. Or the basement. Or the basement. Okay. And Terry's with the assessor's office and he's been very involved in this. And <coughs> in detail and knows how that's set up in their system. We're using their database to work with to insert and make the modifications of this program. And then that data will be passed to the tax commissioner's office in the building. Have you got a chart in this paperwork on the square footage and, and the rate it's going to be? What, what you can do, we can even go further than that. If you will contact the uh, fire department or the assessor's office, they can get your name and actually pull your data up online on QPublic. Look exactly <coughs> at your resident and show you to the penny what yours would be based off of your heated square footage. Are any of y'all got access to that now? You can go to Key Public. Yeah, you just do Google search uh, Walker County uh, Tax Assessor or Key Public. WalkerAssessors.com. WalkerAssessors.com. Thank you. WalkerAssessors.com. You'll see the Key Public link. Go to that, and it's got a pretty sophisticated search engine by name, by stream, I mean, it's partial number. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can search that. Or if you've got a previous tax bill, is it on the tax bill? No, it's not on your tax bill. So you'd have to go online to get the breakout to look at your heated square footage. Did yes, sir. Walker Assessor or Walker Assessment? Assessors. 
Yes, sir, Brad Dollar. Just a couple of comments. Uh, you're talking about public relations, and I have not called Chan since he's been in office on this. The fire trucks and the units running back and forth, being seen at restaurants and stores. I myself, back in the previous administration, have been very involved in fighting a lot of this stuff. I understand one thing, a question was asked, they can stop when they're out checking fire hydrants. Now, on one particular day, I followed a fire engine when it came out of the station there at Rock Springs. I turned around and followed it back to food line. Now you say they can be assessed, but why would they let a man out and then pull all the way over here on the far side of the parking lot till he came out and then started or went back to pick him up went back to the fire station? To me, that needs to be tightened. I know you need food. And you're talking about public relations to me. I've never seen a kid, I've never seen nobody around in the fire truck. For two weeks I worked in Fort Oak, the reason I knew on this, I just didn't go out doing that. Yes, sir. But to me, that could be tight. Well, I think one thing you'll see too, now that you just got two men in a truck, two men at a station starting in October, right now there's three per station. We went from four <coughs> down to three to open up the Flintstone location. Number one, at 7 a.m., they're going to two per station. And 90% of the time, you were going to see them in those smaller QRVs. So we're spreading out to get better coverage. They're going to be responding to even more medical calls because they're changing some of the protocols at the 911 center because there was certain type of calls that were not being responded to based on the protocols. And they're, they're tweaking that. So we're going to see call volume go up even more. So these guys are going to be staying pretty busy. I understand that. So we're, we're, about we're working through some of those efficiencies. Unnecessary runs. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, sir, in the back. In the yellow. Yes, sir. Uh, I thought about on the same line that he was there because I just can't see the fire trucks running back and forth to go get something to eat when they send somebody in the car. And if, uh, if the, uh, you get a call, He's got a radio. He can take his own car and go to the fire. Well, That's ridiculous to, these guys to have are, all that waste. These guys fuel. are much more restricted these days in what they can do as far as responding to a fire call in their vehicle. You know, used to back in the 80s, they could have lights and sirens on the personal vehicles and all kind of things. And those things are not allowed anymore. So if you've got two men in a station, we would rather see them go to the store, That's, two men in a truck, so to get a response. They're not sitting at the station waiting. They can respond to it. They may even be closer to it. That's a mighty expensive hamburger. Let, let me add this too. The majority of our time, the guys bring their food in with them in the morning. The majority of the time they do. But there's days where you start the day out, it just doesn't go right, they run. Run to the store and get it. And like he said, we try to get them to do it when they're out already. That way they're not making a special trip. Every circumstance is different. I see them coming out to uh, Kensington past me uh, a lot. No siren going. They just run, run roads, it seems like. But they may be well, checking fire hydrants. I don't know. They do ISO duties. And some calls are an emergency response. It's a non-emergency response. Maybe you want to handle something to mitigate something. Another thing is, yes, another thing is, I've heard this for the last 40 years, since the first phony fuel shortage in 73, about fuel causes the taxes to go up well up. The diesel's gone down a buck and a half, the gas has gone down a buck and a half close to it, and yet the taxes are going up. That talks me off. And the Social Security, we've got a massive, I think, $8 raise. How are we supposed to pay this extra tax with an $8 a month raise? Well, it's going to put everybody in a situation. If you think you're sick about our situation, just wait till we get through some more of this. <laughs> We're going to see what we really are financially, and it's probably worse than you think. Uh, another thing is, how much tax have we lost buying Mount Cove Farm and buying that stupid bank down there? How much tax how much revenue? Have we lost to Mount Cove and what else? How much the bank, the bank right. about how much uh, the uh, previous uh, czar? What did they? Uh, well, how much tax did we lose? bringing into the county and now we've got to keep that up and got to, I guess got to keep Mountain Cove Farm up too. Uh, Mountain Cove Farms has lost millions. Yes. 
And I would and love, we're paying for it. That's right. And I would love to sell it. Love to. I've even got a couple interested in buying it. But it's got a, it's worth probably five, six, seven million dollars. It's got a fifteen million dollar lien against it. The more the people, the more the leaders foul up, leaves more for us to clean up. Absolutely. We've got to pay for it. Absolutely. The leaders that screw up need to be prosecuted. Yes, sir. Okay, twenty percent were mobile home fires. What percentage of that is commercial? I don't know. We can get that data. I don't know. Right? If you'll get with Chief Hodge <coughs> next week, we can get you more data. I know y'all had some conversation already, but we're not prepared to give you that data tonight. We'll just take a that. But it's a bonus. We can get it. Uh, yes. One more. Okay. Okay. The fire uh, fee is going off. Yes. One hundred thirty dollars. Yes. Now, is the other fee going to replace it on a tax bill? Yes. Sir. It's going to be a public safety fee. <laughs> yes, sir, Dean. Uh, different names. I, I know we have Puckett. Is there any overlap between Puckett and the uh, emergency services that we provide for the county? Overlap in? Well, I mean, if there's an emergency, what services is the actual service going to provide that, that you don't, or what are you going to provide that Puckett doesn't? Okay. I think there's a call. When we sold Puckett, Every fire, not every fire truck, our career fire trucks had the same level that our ambulance had on. We sold bucket. They took everything, including the kitchen sink, on our EMS supplies. Chief Hodge, again, when evaluating, that's not right. We need stuff on our trucks to make sure we can care for you. So we're going to bring that level up to the EMTI level, which is at least IV flus and some minimal drugs. Does that answer your question? No, well, let me give you, for instance, Got someone it. has a heart attack. You're yes. going to show up, right? Yes, sir. Bucket's going to show up. Yes. Okay. What's going to be the difference between the service those two are going to provide and what's going to be there? Is, okay. there, is there an overlap there? Or something? Okay. Same yeah, situation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. They're going to administer the drugs. We're there to support them <laughs> and vice versa. They're going to give them the drugs, a cardiac intervention, okay? If they're not responding to that, a lot of the times, they'll take more of our firemen on the medic unit with them in case CPR is imminent. Because you've got a driver, an EMT driver, and a paramedic in the back. He can't do all that by himself back there. So we'll, we'll put a firefighter in the back of the ambulance to transport to make sure we can initiate CPR and give the best care possible. And sometimes, too, if an ambulance gets there first and they got somebody in cardiac arrest, if it's somebody my size and I'm upstairs, they're going to have, to have lift assists. They're going to have to call the fire department anyway. So well, that's right. my point. My point is, is that Puckett alone cannot do the job. They have to have the support of our emergency. Depends on the call. Any ambulance service is going to need that support, sir. Depends on the type of call. You know, good question. Yeah. So it, it's a team effort, and they, they work very well with our team. Yes, ma'am. So you accompany every ambulance call? Then? No, ma'am. Any life threatening ambulance call. We hear, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to hit it. We hear anything from a stump toe. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm just being legitimate. From a stump toe to a small laceration. No, fire trucks don't go on that. But if life is imminent, possible death, we're, we're going to be there with you. We want to make sure you're okay. Another thing that was happening before, especially with our volunteer stations in the day, if one of our volunteer stations had an alarm go out, they would wait 10 minutes at 911 to hear for a response, a call back. We're in route. We're not doing that anymore. When there's a call that comes in, two stations are dispatched at one time. So you'll dispatch the volunteer staff, or whatever the closest station is, and you'll dispatch a career staff. We would much rather turn around a, a, the career staff and the volunteers are able to respond. So we're changing that level of service because if you've got a major problem and the volunteers are at work on their job because it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they're there for nights and weekends to respond and you've got to wait 10 more minutes and then it's another 15 to get there, we're ended up with responses over 30 minutes. 
So they implemented that back several months ago, I think. Back in July. Back in July or so, they started responding, <coughs> set it up in the database. So when a call comes in, the fire department's dispatched, they dispatch two stations. If the closest station gets in route, or they get on the scene, they can cancel that second team before they get there. So you're going to see more fire truck traffic, and you're probably going to see more going back riding down the road with no lights and siren zone, but you don't know what they might have just been at or was headed to and got turned around because the call got canceled for them. So you're going to see more traffic on the road, but hopefully you're going to see it more so in the quick response vehicles and they're actually in a legitimate business and they're not hanging out at the food line or the McDonald's. So, yes, sir. Y'all still using the Walker State Bridge over there? Yes. Fire, fire. Yes, yes. That is part of our system. But they only go on structure fires. They do structure fires only. They're not allowed to do any other type of response. So they respond to 9% of the calls. No, that's less than that. 2% of the calls. It does. State one. I mean, your state taxes. They pay all that. That's what I'm saying. Kansas is not paying for We've got equipment there. We've got, we've got trucks there that they use. Those trucks are county fire trucks. But they cover the, the insurance and all that stuff. Well, I don't see the they gave them a fire truck, so. You know, we didn't give them a fire truck. No, I see them the fed did. What was yeah. that? The recent years. It's been several years back. They gave them a truck. They may have done away with They may have moved it somewhere. I don't know. I think both, stuff, both trucks that are there are labeled Walker County. Mm -hmm. they are. Yes. So, yeah, they are a very important part of the system, but they only yeah. respond mm -hmm. to 2% of the calls, and they do a great job. Yes. Uh, any more about the fire? We're going to move into other stuff. We're already an hour into this. And the other meetings have been three plus hours, so we want to get moving. Yes, ma'am. Yes, what about um, evaluating maybe who's a bad fire hydrant? Don't okay. Don't you know, need to have some of these uh, costs, not the taxes? There has been, over the years, the past administration did have a lot of fire hydrants, but there's still a lot of ground to cover. <coughs> right now, the Water Authority, the Walk County Water Sewer Authority, which is one of the big providers, nor the Walker County government has got any budgeted money for additional fire hydrants. One of the also challenges are, are there's, there's nine companies that provide water to residents and businesses in Walker County. Nine. And so it's such a large ge geographical area. Now, there is an option. And I think some of you need to highly consider this. If you're rated up because you're more than five miles from a fire station or so a thousand feet or 500 feet from a plug, whatever, if there's a six or eight inch line main running close to you, you can actually, through the water company, purchase your own fire hydrant. And you go, well, why would I do that? It's $3,000. But if it saves you $1,000 a year on your insurance, and you got three or four other neighbors around you, Y'all chip in 500 bucks a piece or something, you get a return on your investment in six months or a year or whatever. So it's worth doing the math. Everyone's situation is going to be different. You may have a willing group to do it, but you've got a two inch line and they go, no, that's not going to work. You know, so you've got to look and evaluate and communicate with Chief Hodge or Chief Lender, and they can help you through that process because potentially. For a little bit of investment in splitting and sharing that cost with your neighbors could save you tens of thousands of dollars over the years. But right now, we're just so upside down financially, which I'm fixing to show you, that we just, it's just not in the budget. We're just trying to take our existing team, existing trucks, existing staff, and try to make it work better for you and operate on $50,000 less. Other fire related questions, yes, no, sir. Not fire. I just want to know if you had any other properties that the county owns that can be sold. Absolutely. <laughs> process of doing that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Other things about what Chief Linders presented, and we'll get off into all this other stuff. All right, we're going to move forward. Okay. Who's blocking us? Okay, I lost my meter. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk, a, Just i got about five or six slides here to talk to you about the, some highlights from the financial audit through our physical year end. Uh, no, these are not in there. 
This is from September 30th, 2016, the financial audit. And this is the first paragraph of the highlights that's put in here by the CPA firm. This audit finally got done July the 20th of this year. It's on the website. It's about 110 pages. So we didn't print it for you. But you can go to walkercountyga.us, walkercountyga.us, go to the government tab, go to this, and you, there's several years of audits. You can pull them up, look at them, save them, print them, whatever you want to do. But I want to read this to you, show you how wordy it is and how they kind of, what I call, hide things. This is the assets and deferred outflow of resources of Walker County exceeded its liabilities and deferred inflow of resources at September 30th, 2016 of $60,313,769. We call that net position. How many of you have heard that word before in an accounting term, as an accounting term, net position? Good and bad. Good, I get to help you with that. Bad that only one of you have heard this term before. You need to always remember this term going forward because you need to keep your eyes on government, including this one, and your local cities. Don't take anything for granted because I have for years, and that's one reason why I run to be part of the solution. So we're going to talk more about net position. A decrease of $6,727,174 from the prior year before the effects of the blending of the Walker County Development Authority. Development authorities are government entities. They should be audited every year. This was the first time I mandated it was done. Argued with the auditing company that was included in this audit. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, but can Joe pick that up a little bit? Because there's tax in my way. <laughs> yeah, can you get it up any higher? Yeah. Would it help if we turn the lights off too? No, the lights are fine. Okay, there you go. Oh. Put something under there. Maybe this will help. Put this somewhere. Hey, yeah, yeah. we're good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> we'll get Keystone to lead us. We'll be good. All right. <laughs> okay. The development authority had not been audited before, even though the board had voted to have it audited. The prior county attorney stopped the audit after they had already started. You're going to hear some things tonight you never heard before, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The net position, $67,543,994, is restricted. That means you can't use it to run the general operations of the county. It's restricted money. A lot of that means they're fixed assets, they're grants, they're bonds, I mean not grants, not bonds, but grants, uh, special money from other entities. You can't use it to run your day-to-day -day operation. 67 million. is restricted as to what the funds may be expended for. The remaining deficit balance of $7,543,994 is what's available to meet the ongoing obligations to the citizens and the creditors. So at the end of September, this county had negative position, negative net position. When I went to the University of Georgia for county government training after I got elected, they said that your net position ought to be two to three times your monthly expenses. Our monthly expenses run about $2 million. We should have four to six million dollars positive net position. We're seven and a half million negative, folks. So people come up and say, well, why did the sole commissioner second week in office go borrow four million dollars from the Bank of Lafayette? Because we had no money. When I got here, I go to Greg McConnell, the comptroller of the county, and said, Greg, how much money do we have in the bank today? He said, I knew you'd ask. I've already looked. Round number is $800,000. Well, I already knew because I had already studied 16 years worth of audits. I knew payroll was a million a month. Tax collection took place December 20th. December 20th. From December 20th when the taxes are due till January 2nd, we're down to $800,000 to last us until December of next year. 
It gets worse, folks. I said, did y'all get all the bills paid? They're right there on the corner of your desk, sir. How much? I don't know. We'll add them up. I said, get them in the system. Three and a half million dollars worth of past due bills that all the way went back into June when I got here in January. So I knew we were in trouble. Much worse than I thought. I figured we would have enough money to operate based off my projections of pulling information and understanding things. And I figured we'd have enough money to operate through the end of February. I was eight weeks short in my projections. So, this is on Roman numeral page six. If you want to go back and look at the audit, you can read that word for word so you don't have to write it down and remember it. Just write down source 2016 audit, Roman numeral six. So, a deficit balance is what we've got to work with, folks. So here's another statement. This is the statement of net position of the activities reported in the county's net position and changes in net positions. One can think of the county's net position as the difference between the assets and the deferred outflow of the resources and liabilities and the deferred inflow of resources as one way to measure the county's financial health or financial position. In a small business outside of government, governmental accounting is a little tricky. I think they do that on purpose to confuse the average business person. What you call your equity or your retained earnings in your business, net position in government. A net position is one indicator whether its financial health is improving or deteriorating. However, other non-financials Factors will need to be considered, such as changing county property taxes, if your property taxes are having to go up, and the condition of county roads. I'm sure nobody dodged a pothole getting here tonight. All county roads pretty good around your place? No. I don't think so, Robert. Not even close. So, this is on page Roman numeral 7, word for word. All right, this here talks about business type activities. This is a governmental accounting word to tell you this is your land field and Mountain Co. Farms. Why couldn't they just tell you that? If you're a private citizen and you pull up the government audit, you go online and you go, business type activities? What's that? Just say it, land field and Mountain Co. Farms. It says, that the county's business type activities operating expenditures exceeded operating revenue by $1,334,086. Revenues were insufficient to recoup the costs largely, largely due to high depreciation expense, which most people don't understand what that is, accrued post closure, that's really a foreign term, and operating losses, a transfer from the general fund, this is one of my favorite statements, a transfer from the general fund was made to cover most of the losses. That's a nice way of camouflaging. We didn't get all the bills paid here either, folks. So the next slide, this is the way I put it in layman's terms so it's easy for us all to understand, including myself. The county is land field in Mountain Co. Farm. We spent more than we took in by $1,034,086. Sales were insufficient to cover the overall spending of having too many employees and other expenses were out of control due to bad management and no budget. Operating losses were mostly due to letting out-of-state companies have the key to the gate and charging them a reduced rate during the day. Now, if you've got a key to the gate, we charge you when you're there during the day, that's your minus one. A transfer from the general fund, your property tax money, was made to cover most of the losses, but some of the bills didn't get paid here either. But folks, this, if you go back and look through all 16 audits, every single one of them lost money on the landfill every single year for 16 years. From all indications, talking to people internally, look at the numbers, June of 2017, was the first time the landfill posted a profit after its full expense load. Wow. Appreciation, post-closure, everything. 
Why? Why? What changed? Leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Okay. Management. The guy running the place. Reduction of staff. Okay. Our four largest customers, we divorced them. Because we went up on the rates. They took their key. They took their chains and locks to the gate. That's what you're talking about. Was the United States bringing the trash down? On Our four top customers. Okay. Volume They're no box. longer with us. They're no longer with us. They I went back to Tennessee. You see a difference. I've had other people tell me you can yeah. see the traffic's yeah. way down. And the trash. You know what revenue has done? They're going up. That's a whole other conversation. Okay, I know this is hard to see. Can, can everybody in the back make those numbers out? You want to turn the lights out for a minute and see if it's any better? Okay. All right. This is the top half of the balance sheet. Any government audit that you look at, this is part of your training tonight. You know who's coming for training. Part of your training is every government audit, numeric page one, not Roman numeral. The numeric page one is your consolidated balance sheet, no matter who it is. Our consolidated balance sheet says has all of our assets listed here. You got your general government activities, your business type activities, your total, and you have to add in your, uh, your health department as a component unit. Health department's in pretty good shape. This right here is your total assets of Walker County government, 129 million. Second half of the page one. These are all of our liabilities, folks. As of September 30, this September 30th, this year, by that we owe. You notice I say that we owe. Because basically what I'm here to talk to y'all about tonight, really when it gets down to it, is about our inheritance. One of the first meetings, a lady came up to me and said, Hey, there's there's some people here that's Pretty upset. Think you may need to call the sheriff's department. <laughs> We're just going to talk about my inheritance. I ain't done any of this. Don't be mad at me. I'm here to clean it up, folks. This is our inheritance. We're in this together. So, when you look at all of our inherited debts, sometimes inheritance can be negative. Okay. Total liabilities, $69,925,772. When the previous administration took over 16 years ago, $11 million, over $3 million cash on hand. When I took over, $70 million in debt, 800000 cash on hand. Huge difference. So this is the third half of the balance sheet. Point out to you, page one, numeric one. Always look for numeric one. If you forget everything else I say, remember numeric one, remember net position, and the next term you need to know is unrestricted. Sometimes, and it's going to show you that if it's in captions, that means negative, it means a deficit. <coughs> So we've got an unrestricted deficit net position of seven and a half million dollars. So even if you didn't read the highlights, you didn't understand anything, go to the page one, net position, unrestricted, look at that number. That'll tell you a whole bunch that quick. On any audit. So, well, let's look at the past. In 2015, mid-year 2015, no, excuse me, I think it's mid-year 2016. Mid-year 2016, a friend of mine did an open records request because I was hearing rumblings in the community. Hey, our county's in trouble, the employees are scared, the checks are going to bounce, people are leaving, vendors are not getting paid. I'm a business guy, I'm a numbers guy, I don't see the other. Never looked at one before. So we did an open records request, got the 14 and 15 audit. I went through it, first couple hours, I had to lay it down, folks. I thought I was physically going to puke. I was sick. Why? Because I had voted for this past administration. Our company had donated their campaign. Now, this public record is nothing to hide. 
I mean, Tyler keeps talking about it, but I might as well keep talking about it. And so, I was sick because not only do I live here and I've got to help pay this back, but I was asleep at the wheel. Most everybody here has been asleep at the wheel and throughout our entire county. We've all been asleep at the wheel. So, this is a summary here. This takes your total assets, your liabilities. Here again, net position, unrestricted, on your general government's 5.3 negative. Last year, 2015, a negative million five. This is your, your uh, business type. When I got sick and thought I was going to be really sick, we was only 3.4 negative, folks. In one year, it went from 3.4 negative to 7.5 negative. What about if they were still here? And we were all still asleep. Because here's what they learned a long time ago. If they don't raise your taxes, you don't wake up. How many of you would have been here tonight if, if a tax or fee was not going up? How many of you would have showed up here tonight? Less than five. Hindsight, if I had this to do all over again, and I've had some conversations with some people about this, I'd have took the current millage rate and I'd have times it by two, doubled it, so I could get about three or 4,000 people to show up. Knowing that I was going to reduce it. But to wake up and scare and shake as many people as I could shake and say, please, 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 wake up. We're in big trouble. And you think you'll survive that, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> We're just talking about your inheritance. Because once I got you here, I would have said, hey, double the millage, I will back off of that. I want you here. That's think? why I went, instead of having three public meetings, I've had five, and I'm willing to continue the meetings to keep them going if I get people to show up. Did you ever think about uh, getting the uh, previous administration to come verify these papers? <laughs> <laughs> they just tell me there's a remedy for all the debt. Yes, sir. You may tell me there's a sort of high loss here. There's a huge jump in the other liabilities is where, the, is where that all occurs. On uh, the primary government, all right, two problems, other liabilities from 4.2 to 10.3. What's primarily taken up in that? Greg in the room. And that's where we didn't, I mean, we didn't get the break. You know, when you go right here, when you go from other liabilities, 4.2 to 10.3. Greg, when we look here, the question is, and this is on the consolidated other liabilities. Last year was 4.2, jumped to 10.3. Do you know what's broken out between long-term and just other without looking? Because the auditors did this. I don't know. Basically, they took, you see, those. that's the total number that we had. It's just how they classify them. And I don't know the answer to that. Right. You want to go back? Or you go back and yeah, well, if you go back, I mean, uh, it doesn't it's, it's say some place other there. there. It's going to be a compilation of all that right there. It's a comparison of time. Yeah. yeah, we would have to get them to give us the breakout on that. Okay, so let's look a little further back. This here's 2009, 2010. All right, unrestricted. Total, we's 9.4 million positive. This is when we were all sleeping really good. Because they were telling us how low our taxes were. We second lowest in the state, third lowest in the state. That's just like listening to the rain. And we're sleeping and everything's wonderful. Don't raise my taxes. Don't wake me up. I'll leave you alone. They figured that out. But what we didn't know is that once they figured that out, we just won't raise your taxes. We'll just increase your debt. Because we're spending the money anyway. We just won't wake you up, so we'll just spend it anyway, and we'll do it by borrowing the money, and you're still asleep. When I say y'all and we, I, I'm number one in line. I'm, as, I'm the guiltiest one in the room, okay? So don't take that that I feel like I'm pointing everybody else out. Okay, so here we are back, just to show you 15 and 16. 
how crazy things went after 2010. All right, here's another problem. Some of you that have been here in the past administration, when you've come to a budget hearing meeting or they was raising your taxes, you'd walk in the door on a good time and they would hand you this right here and say, here's the budget. Here's the departments, here's department numbers, what it is. Okay, they give you second page, this would be three and a half pages. Take a good look at that. That's what you get. You'd have no idea what they did last year, the year before, what they've done this year, what, you know, how much of that is personnel, how much of that's fuel, as mentioned a while ago. How much of that did they go buy stuff, like big trucks, lease cars? Capital, capital expenditures, we got no idea. Just don't raise my taxes. I don't care how you spend it. 2018, here's what's going to change. You're going to get something that starts looking like this. This is 74 pages, folks. There's over seven, or there's 70 departments in the general fund, individual departments. You're going to see 2013 actual expenditures line by line. You're going to see 2014 actual, 15 actual, 16 actual, 17 actual to date, 17 year in projected, 18 budget requests, and then once we finish, you'll get another line item over there that is say 18 approved by a commissioner. You're going to see what every department, what every elected official requested what I approved. So I'm working with these departments and with these elected officials. There's so many of them, I haven't got it all done. Yeah, I could have come out here and thrown a budget out, made y'all feel good, played the games of the past. Y'all went back to slaves probably. But we're going to work this to get it right. We've got to have a balanced budget by October 1st. We will have a balanced budget by October 1st. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. A lot of people say, quit putting the burden on the property taxpayer, the property owner, the people that own the houses. Quit putting the burden on them. We're tired of paying the burden. Well, when you look at the numbers, that top line up there, real property, that's houses, businesses, that's real property, projected for this year is $10.5 million. We got over $23, $24 million budget. It's less than half. It's property tax. Real property. And you've got some other properties here. You know, you've got motor vehicle, uh, intangible, personal property, franchise taxes from the electric company, television company, local option sales tax, alcohol beverage, excise energy, insurance premium, tax penalties, interest, on and on and on. You get almost 20 million. Almost. And you got all of these. All of these are different revenue streams. It's coming in. That's another almost eight eight hundred thirty thousand dollars of you know different things coming in as revenue. Here's another half page. So when you get to the end, you've got uh, rent, royalty, interest, and you add it all up. As of two weeks ago, we're predicting twenty-two million seven hundred thirty-six thousand dollars in revenue. So here you can look back over the prior years. Okay, this is current year. This is next year. What happened? Went down. Lost revenue. Lost revenue. This right here is 33 million. It's 2016. Revenue, that's distorted. That's where they started doing all the crazy buying and selling up your Mountain Co. Farms, your accident, and all that crazy stuff. But you can see all the way back to 2013 revenue. All right, expenses. You'll be able to see every department. This right here, governmental body, that means the commissioner's office. Yes, sir. Property taxes were going up consistently the whole time. So the other revenue is what's going down. Is there any particular department that is? A lot of it's motor vehicle tax, where they changed it. We're used to paying the Avalorum tax. Okay. They, the state's giving the last share of that money, and so all counties, all governments <coughs> are taking a big hit. 
and the states have got a big windfall. Fines and fees are down. Uh, you know, just there's a lot of there's a story you know pretty much behind all of them go down. But this right here, this is the this is the commissioner's office. You'll be able to see wages, vacation, holiday, health care, Social Security, Medicare, retirement, unemployment, workers' comp, everything. Every line. 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. You've never seen this before. Nobody. So, breaks it out by year, subtotal. You'll be able to see all the utilities, all the energy expenses. Capital. This is where the big money gets spent. Any, any other transfers or interest or anything. Okay. 2016, the commissioner's office spent $902,000. People keep asking on social media, where's the commissioner make cuts? My budget request next year is $517,000. That doesn't include the accounting staff, nothing. That's just my direct personnel. Oh, about $400,000 difference. Just one part. So, this here is debt service. These are all over payments, folks. This is principal payments, who it's to. Uh, let's, see. In, let's see, capital lease interest, Kansas State Bank. That's who we finance some police cars from. We'll talk about that more in a minute. He says right there, we've got a couple of those. A lease principal, Kansas City Sheriff's cars. All the interest and all were projected to spend $1.7 million. Look how that's really increased over the last three years from what they actually were spending prior. They got a real spending spree, didn't they? These are transfers out. This is where they were taking money, transferring money to cover other departments. I wanted to show you right here, transfer out of fire department, 1.38 million, 743,000, 1.4 million. 2018 is gonna be zero. They're not going to be transferring any money to the fire department. They're going to be self-sufficient, self-sustaining. We cut their budget fifty thousand dollars. They have a balanced budget. That, that department's done. Chief Hodge is on top of it. I made a couple of suggestions to him. He agreed with me. We back to it some more. Is done. Did that happen in sixteen? Since it says zero there too. Uh, right there. I don't. Unless it got booked somewhere else. It surprised me there wasn't one in 16. We have to look into that one. Sometimes they get a little creative. Uh, so, here's the thing we've got transfers out. Okay. Bottom line 22 million in revenue, 26.9 million in expenses. We got to cut another four point two million dollars to get balanced. Now you know why we don't have a budget ready. Now, if you look here, in twenty sixteen, the revenue is distorted, but they spent twenty six million dollars in twenty sixteen. This year to date, we've spent nineteen million seven hundred thirty eight thousand. We're projected to spend a little over 22 million. We think that number's low because we got some year-end expenses and stuff. We think that number reality to get us through the next six weeks is probably going to jump up another couple million dollars. Let's just say it's 24 million just for conversation. Real numbers, 24 million. And we're going to end up in total expenses, barring we have no tornadoes, floods, because all that kind of stuff you're supposed to use your emergency fund. We don't have one of those folks. So if we get a catastrophic hit, like the big tornado that came through, and you've got to expunge all those resources and overtime and clean up and food and shelter and on and on, oh yeah, they'll declare us a disaster. Absolutely. We'll get FEMA money in about two years. It's about how long it takes. Sometimes they give it to you in installments. So you've got to float that cash flow if you have a catastrophic event. We don't have a rainy day fund. So we've got to cut another 4.2 out of our budget 
probably going to spend this year about 24 million. That's going to probably come in about two million dollars less than they spent last year. I've been in office at the end of this budget cycle. I've been in office nine months. So the first three months on this budget was the previous administration's business practices or lack thereof. Yes, sir. Kevin, is that going to include the paying or laying your back? Great question. No. no. When you back up here, all these payments right here, which is added into the budget, $1.75 million, when you look at your expenses of $26 million that's been requested, when you look at all that, the $7.8 million that's owed to Erlanger, no, excuse me, $8.7 million that's owed to Erlanger, there's zero funding for in this budget at this point. Zero. And it has to be paid back by. They want it now. Erlanger has a federal court summary judgment. It's already been appealed at least twice. Federal courts every time is told Walker County citizens, you owe Erlanger $8.7 million, $5,000 to be exact. You owe it. We'll tell you again you owe it. Erlanger says, hey, we want to work with you, new commissioner. We know you didn't create it. I've met with him three times, the CEO of Erlanger three times. Pretty nice guy. Until you start talking about the debt. He wants his money, he wants it now. But he's willing to work with us. He wants a million dollars every 90 days. <laughs> Not only did he tell me that verbally, he actually was nice enough to put it to me in writing. So, can we say every 90 days or every 120 days? That's what I'm saying. <coughs> they're wanting every quarter, every 90 days. So basically, they're wanting. Four million dollars a year anticipated. Is that shared by the coast camp? No, sir. They paid theirs. They settled for six point two five million. Walker County's litigated it. We owe eight point seven. When you add in the interest and the attorney fees that the federal court judge awarded, we're back almost to ten million. Just a little shot. And it's growing daily. It's headed back toward that $10 million cap. Yes, ma'am. That was the question I was going to ask about the risk of interest. Oh, yeah. The more we delay. And it's like, it's a high number. It's like 5 or 6% or something. It's high for government. It's real high. So, that's why I want you at this meeting. Because I need your help. We gotta help figure out how to solve this problem. One of the problems that we've got is people are being somewhat confused by the way it has to be advertised of what's really going on with your taxes. As an example, people think, all right, my total tax bill is a thousand dollars. Says in the paper they're going up twenty percent. That means he's going to add two hundred dollars to my tax bill. That's not the case. I'm going to show you one. This is, first of all, I'm going to show you the millage rate. People are telling me, well, by God, I'm just going to move out of that county. I'm going to move out. We, they love to compare us all the time against Catoosa. If you lived in Catoosa this year or last year, you would pay more in taxes than if you do if you live in Walker County. Most people don't realize that. So when you look at the 2016 rate, these by total taxes, this is the unincorporated millage rate. Then you've got the school. I control this column now, and only this column. The school board controls that column. They're elected school board. Got a county school board and a city school board. Their number is more than double than my number. <coughs> so I think we got a great school system. The graduation rate's climbing. I think they got a great board. But if you just want to be upset to be upset about something, and you're upset about taxes, you need to talk to the school board. Because they're charging you double what this place is charging. Okay? And I don't want you to be upset at all, but if you look at where your tax load is, it's right there, folks. When you do a total millage, total tax for 2016, 
If you move to any of these counties right here, you're going to pay more. Pretty nice counties. Especially, I mean, Floyd's great. That's where I'm, where I'm trying to say. Very kind. Of, Whitfield, Gordon, those are all very nice counties. You'd have to move this way to pay less. Alright, 2017. We're going up two mils. That number changed by two points. We're still about middle of the pack. It's not, not horrible, but we're not up here either. Murray's still trying to get their system to work. They did a new system. They've got some software problems, so sole commissioner there as well. Good friend of mine now. We talked. He said, I can't give you anything. But Catoosa did drop a little below us. About, about a mil difference if you go to Catoosa. Your closing cost cost you more than that. Okay? So about a mil difference if you went to Catoosa. Alright. So how does all this work? And this was a learning curve for me. And I had to go to Terry's office a couple times and call him a couple times to make sure I got it right. Because it's a little confusing how this is calculated. I think they want it to be confusing at the state level so we won't ask questions. These are just examples that I made up. This is I just pulled numbers out of the air to, to make an example, so this is not anybody that we know. If you figure a, a home value at $83 a square foot, $66,000 value, we're going to take 40%, which is going to be your assessed value, $26,669. In this example, and only in this example, if you get the homestead exemption, which means you own and live in your primary residence and you've applied for it at any age, any income, you can get this exemption. So with that exemption, it'll reduce your <coughs> homestead that will take that $2,000 off. So you'll take your total value times .001. Now there's more than one way to do this math. This is the way it's simple for me, it's easy for me to explain to you, but there's other ways to arrive at these same numbers. 24.669, you take, this is 2016, this is last year, take that net number times the county government millage rate of 7.83, the taxes on a $66,672 property is going to be $193.36, and you're going to send to school $410. Then you're going to add your fire fee on this 800 square foot house, and in 2016, it's 130 bucks. Total taxes are 733 dollars. So 130 dollars goes to the fire department, 410 to the schools, 193 to the county government to provide everything else. Another example. I'll run through this kind of quick. Well, this is 2017. Same math. We increased the millage rate. The school system dropped a couple of thousandths of a percent. Just very minimal. 800 square foot house. It's going to go to $742. You compare it. This person here, in this example, at $66,000 home, is going up $9.55, folks. That's not 20 or 25% of your tax bill. Because I can only affect your fee and your county portion. All right, let's look at another example. Run through this pretty quick. 1,200 square foot home. $130 fire fee, 2016. <coughs> Do the same math. $1,059. 2017, fire fee is going to drop by 10 bucks. It's going down. Because if you're under 30, if 1,300 square feet or less, you're going to get a decrease. Well, I guess 1,299, you're going to get a decrease. Millage rate went up. So when you look at the difference, in this example, a 1,200 square foot home, valued at $100,000, which is the medium home value in Walker County, it's $100,000. That's why a $100,000 example had to be used in the advertisement. You have to use your medium household income, your medium household value. Am I saying that right? Your medium household value in your advertisement. So everybody in the middle knows that's what's changing. In this example, which is mid of our market, Went up $65.93 total. Alright, now we're going to advance to a 2,000 square foot home. Mass all the same, just changed the square footage mount. 
$130 fire fee on a 2,000 square foot home because it's 2016. 2017, fire fee goes up to $200, 2,000 square foot house, $1,911. Increase $188 on a $166,000 home. Any questions thus far? Does this help? Makes it a lot simpler, don't it? We're going to release this all on our website so you can access it. You can take plug your numbers in. Basically, what you would do, take your total number <coughs> times 40% times the new rate, which is about uh, times these rates right here. You can take this screen right here, 2017 screen, insert your number right here, times there, if you had the homestead exemption or not. Now, any of you that get other exemptions due to age, <coughs> agriculture, there's a lot of other exemptions you're going to be paying even less. But we're just taking the most common example. Okay? You would have to look at your individual circumstance to get your actual cost if you've got other exemptions or if you're agriculture or business or whatever. This is just the typical exemption I wanted to, or typical example I wanted to show you. I was looking on a spreadsheet the other day. 90% of our home value, if I'm looking at it correctly, is under $200,000. So you're saying you're basically a big line share of our citizens are going to be paying probably less than $300 increase on their property tax with the fire fee is going to fluctuate to something on square footage. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? Now, one of the things we talked, yes, sir. This is, uh, if this ever gets paid down the the negative part that we're in is the taxes ever going to go down? It's going to depend on y'all. It's going to depend on all of us to hold our government accountable. Because what government well, needs come, to do... How come they can't hold the last administration accountable somehow or another? That's a good question for your DA. District Attorney. Okay. You gotta stay involved, you gotta look at the numbers, you gotta hold your government accountable. But for this county to be healthy, we need that net position to be a good, strong, positive number to have cash flow and so forth. So we talk about cash flow. I mentioned earlier about borrowing money. Tax anticipation note is a legal form that local governments can use to borrow money. That's what I had to go do in January. I've taken some criticism because people say, well, he's supposed to be in there fixing things. They just went run up more debt. No, I've got the money to pay for what they'd already spent. And they took all the money to run the county for all of this calendar year, and they spent it too. So we had to work with two banks to get two lines of credit at $4 million each. We're $6.5 million into that. We probably are going to have to have all that before the end of the year, being December. So... Getting the $4 million from Bank of Lafayette was fairly easy. I went to them and said, hey, we got it. Here's our total spreadsheet. Here's our cash flow. We know the second week of January, because the county, yeah. the county department didn't work, we had a cash flow sheet about yay long. We knew to get through December, we were going to need $8 million. Bank of Lafayette said we can help with half of it. It's come about May, I got active trying to find the other $4 million. I contacted eight banks. Immediately, first conversation, five of them told me, no way. Not going to loan you a dime. After the fifth bank told me no, I'll be very candid with you. I got a little concerned. Because I knew the likelihood of me finding something was getting slim. In my business background, working in a family business, plus we always managed our companies as best we could, I've never been told no by a bank. That, that comes up. That's hard for me to swallow, folks. I took it a little bit personally. So I got very concerned. So I reached out to Senator Mullis, who had already been super help, helpful to me. I said, Jeff, here I got a problem. I said, we need some help from the state of Georgia. He said, like what? Money? Loans? 
debt forgiveness, whatever you can get us, I'll set up the meeting. The next week, we had a meeting at the Capitol, in his office, in his side conference room. He was able to assemble the treasurer, the main top guy that's the treasurer for the state of Georgia, who I felt pretty certain for all the reports to the governor, top guy. The commissioner of the Department of Revenue, top position. The commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, which is very important working with local government. And their deputy commissioner. GIFA, which is an, ent an entity within government that works with solid waste and landfills and different things. That commissioner and his deputy commissioner. So I had a pretty good audience, thanks to Senator Moss. I couldn't put that meeting together myself, I don't think. So to get their attention, I took some financial information, and to get their attention real quick, I said, folks, appreciate you meeting here today. I'm sole commissioner of Walker County. I just need to know if you want this county back on a Monday or a Friday. That got their attention. What do you mean? I said, we're in trouble. Big time trouble. I'm running out of money. I've got less than about two weeks worth of money to run this county. And I've already cut payroll $1.2 million. I've cut everything I can cut. I'm not buying anything. I'm still driving my personal automobile. I need some help. You can hurt a pin drop. What do you, what, what do you mean? I mean, what can we do? I said, well, look, let me show you my information. Went through our negative net position. They knew exactly what that was. Never seen one like this. <laughs> I said, that's like the University of Georgia showed me. He asked me to keep a copy up so he could use it as a class project. <laughs> Honest statement. Honest statement. They said, you've got a real problem. I said, I'm hoping it was we. And so they're sitting there talking about different things, and they go, no, we don't have a legal authority to do that. No, we can't do that. No, you can't do that. We just went back and forth. So finally, the guy had been sitting over quiet from Jeepa. He said, I can help. I said, great. Get somewhere. He said, you've got a million dollar loan with us of your landfill expansion. I said, that's right. It's right here on the, on the spreadsheet. We took all the debt spreadsheet. 3.13% interest, which is a great rate. He said, I can cut your interest rate in half. I've got the authority to do that. And I can defer your payments for 12 months to have you on your cash flow. I said, perfect. Thank you. That's great. Now, who's next? <laughs> I'm serious. True story. Who's next? Got quiet again. I said, folks, we're in trouble. Need some help. There's two things you need to know about the state of Georgia. Number one, we're one of two states that is against the law to file bankruptcy. It's in the state charter that it's against the law to file bankruptcy as a government entity in the state of Georgia. I think I was the other one. I'd like to Google that and check me out. Number two, it's the only state in the country that you can have a sole commission government for a county. Out of 159 counties, how many are there that have a sole commission government? Eight. And it's shrinking. So, commissioner, new, in a state you can't bankrupt, sole commissioner, it's all on me, folks. And I can't carry the load. I can't do it by myself. Not physically, not mentally. I don't even know all the questions. So, I reached out to people that I trust. I reached out to smarter people than me. Reached out to the Association of County Commissioners. Said, I need some help. They said, we'll send a team up at no charge for three days. They sent three of their top people up here about a month ago now. They stayed three solid days. We sat in this conference room for nine hours a day straight. Well, they did take a lunch break. Did cost this county a dime. <coughs> they wouldn't even let me buy my cocoa. Nothing. They said, we, we are here for no money, no compensation, no travel, no hotel, no nothing. 
we sat there and started dissecting our county financially, looking at things, looking at ideas, looking at plans. When they first got here, they said, look, it's not as bad as you think. We've been doing this a long time, and we had sent them a stack of information per their requests. I mean, Greg worked several hours getting everything together. It's not as bad as you think. We've looked at some of your numbers. It's not as bad as you think. There's 159 counties. This is why we said at the office at the association. So 159 counties. We pretty well can add up there's 159 problems that you're going to experience. We just don't know which one you're on. Or maybe two or three. But we've seen them all. You've just got one or two or three of all the problems. We can help. Great. I was feeling better. So we start going through things, looking at the numbers. By the end of the third day after lunch, they wouldn't let me go lunch with them. They'd go by themselves so they could talk without my, me or my staff. We had different staff people in and out, had elected officials in and out that were available. They wouldn't let me go lunch with them, didn't meet with them after in the evening or the morning. Strictly business, 100%. Like trained professionals. Two of them have been former county chairmen of, co of commissioners. Most of them average tenure was over 10 years with the association. This was the best of the best. That third day after lunch, they come back and said, there's something we need to level with you about. I said, all right, lay it on me. I can handle it. I said, you're the worst we've ever seen as far as your county. This is the worst of the worst we've ever seen. You've got more problems, more hurdles, but we know you can do it because we're going to help you. We will be back very soon. We had a whole flip chart of stuff that I got to get implemented to help get us out of this ditch. And a lot of those things that we're going to be rolling out includes all of y'all. Because if I don't have your support, don't have your backing, don't have your buy-in, I probably can't get 60% of it accomplished. Because some of it's some pretty tough decisions. $70 million worth of debt with a declining revenue is going to be hard to overcome. One of the things that they suggested, I want to talk to you about tonight, that's in your packet. They said you need to, as quick as possible, implement a T-splosh. Transportation, transportation special purpose local option sales tax is what that stands for. It only become legal to do this year. About five years ago or so, they passed or put on the ballot a regional t splash that had about 15 or 16 counties all coming together in regions. And they were trying to get everybody to pass a one cent sales tax, put all your money together to do big projects. I voted against it because I could very clearly see all that money was going to go south closer to Atlanta to build their infrastructure. We were going to be what's referred to as a donor county. We were going to give that money to the big cities. I voted no. This region, it failed. And good. So the General Assembly took them a little time. They're a little slow. Took them a little time. They retooled and said, hey, there's still a need out there. We'll allow counties to do a single t splash up to 1%. You can do anything less than that, but you can't go over 1%. Another great suggestion. Make it 2%. I don't have legal authority to do that. People say all the time, you're the sole commissioner. You can do whatever you want to found out the hard way now. You can't. They say, well, raise your other sales tax. Raise your local option sales tax. Don't have the legal authority to do that. Another great suggestion I saw on Facebook, do a will tax. I called the tax commissioner. Hey, let's do a will tax. I don't know if we can do that. She called the tax commissioner. I called four attorneys. First one give me an answer. Can't do that. Here's why. I thought it's got to be a loophole. I called the second one. <clears throat> Called third one, called fourth one. They're all telling me the same thing. Can't do that. There's about seventy thousand registered vehicles in Walker County. We charged a hundred bucks every time you renew your tag to go toward the debt. We could not. We'd have a big stick. We could really do something. And that way, it's applied equally. So I don't have a lot of levers to pull, but where I need your support is to vote yes. For the T-splash. And you go, well, I'm not convinced yet. That's just dirt. That's just bringing on another tax. 
I'm there. I promised myself I would never vote in self-imposed tax increase. I know some of you sitting here saying that to yourself. It's going to take our sales tax from 7% to 8%. When you go to Chattanooga, go to Hamilton Place Mall, or go downtown, what's the tax rate? Nine Almost 10%. I think it's nine and three quarters. So we're going to make, we're going to go to eight if we all vote to do this. So it's almost 10%. We're still going to be less. You say, yeah, but they don't have income tax. Well, I know, but when you're spending money from Georgia, and you go into Tennessee and spend money, anytime you go outside of Walker County to any county in America and you spend a dollar, technically you are classified as a tourist. Those are tourism dollars. You think tourism, I go on vacation. No. When we go to Hamilton Place Mall and we buy a new shirt or a new pair of shoes, we're a tourist. We spend a lot of money in tourist dollars elsewhere. So, here's the dilemma that I'm in. And these guys could not believe this when they got here. This is one of the things they questioned me about. They said, what about your LAMIG money? Because that's another fancy acronym from the state, which is a local maintenance grant for road paving. said, how are you doing on your LAMIG money? I said, I'm still sitting on 2017's money. I said, it's a separate account over at Bank of Lafayette. How much you got? I said, $2,000, $3,000 under a million. They said, you've got, a, you've got a million dollars sitting over at Bank of Lafayette. Why have you not spent it? To repay for others. We've seen some of your roads. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you not paid any of your roads? I said, there's a caveat. To spend that money, I've got to put 30% with it. It's 30% match. I've got to come up with $300,000. We don't have it, folks. I'd have to go borrow it. That's what the past administration's done. The 10 miles or so of road they paint every year, they'd go borrow the money to pave the roads to keep you asleep. Because if your roads are paved and your tax are not increasing, nobody's going to show up. You keep, you keep every, all the vultures away. So, what do y'all think's going to happen come December, or on or before December of this year? With that million dollars sitting over in the bank. What do you what do you think is gonna happen if we don't spend that money? Who's with? They're gonna send us another million. Oh. They're gonna send us our 2018 money. Now I need six hundred thousand. My problem just got worse. We sat around the table and laughed about it. They said, we never seen a Kelly that's gonna have two million dollars to make that can't spend. I said, I don't have 600000 I can't take the risk of what little bit of line of credit I got left to risk using that money to pay and have an EF3 tornado come through here. I'm having to think about things now, folks, I never thought about before. When I see a fire truck go down the road, or an ambulance, or a sheriff's car, I have to think totally different today. There's a lot of risk. By the way, I'm the sole commissioner. It all comes back to me at the end of the day. So, if we can come together and pass a T-splosh, 1%, it's going to be on the ballot November the 7th when I sign the papers here shortly. If you will support me on that and vote for that, that will bring in, we're projecting, $3 million. 75% of that will go to the county. 25% of it is distributed and allocated to the cities, proportion off of their formulas that's been used in the past. Every city's a little different. It's in your pack. You can see it. <coughs> that's going to be worth about $2.5 million to Walker County. I can take that $2.5 million and match it with that money I got over in the bank. We can start paving roads. Doesn't affect the general fund. Doesn't affect your property taxes. Sales tax money. When all these tourists come in, they're going to help us pay for that. Just like we help them pay for theirs when we go to Tennessee or Alabama or Florida or wherever. We want to share the love. If you don't want to put burden on your property taxes, vote for the t splash Yes, sir. I just want to ask you a question. This is going to, you're going to face this question. Gentleman mentioned me being asked a little bit earlier about being prosecuted. 
we all know that she misappropriated over $9 million of splash funds. Even though she had a list of projects she was supposed to follow, it was ignored, like the police cars and road plays, and we missed out on those matching funds. What guarantees do we have from you that the money's going to be spent the way it's supposed to be spent? You need to show up to the meetings, hold this administration accountable to show you the reports, is one thing. Number two, you've got to trust my integrity, which I've got to earn. Okay? And number three, we're not going to bond it, so we're not going to get a big pile of money for Christmas up front. We're not going to go in debt for it like they've done before, and they go like, oh, we got all this money, let's go blow it. We're going to spend it as it comes <clears> in, <throat> so we get the best use of those dollars. We're going to pull them dollars and squeeze them as hard as we can. So it's a great question, and there's going to be people, absolutely, you're right, I'm going to get hit with that. The past administration misappropriated splash money. What's going to keep you from doing it? What's going to keep me from doing it is my own personal integrity, my own morals. But number two, you need to also make sure those are in check. Can I follow up on that? Yes. Is there going to be a list similar to the splash list that was done on roads and bridges that's going to be worked on the form and use of this money? Yeah, we will be working on the list. We don't have it ready tonight. I understand that. And the reason we're under such a time restraint, one reason Mr. Buckner's here tonight, I'm sure, is we have to have all of this documented and signed and done before the end of this month. It has to be to Kennesaw State University, who handles all the database for all the elections, to get it on the ballot in November. So we've had to move very quickly with intergovernmental agreements with the city, documentation and all that we do internally here tonight, public meeting and all, to get that on the ballot. Yes, sir. How long is this? Five years. Five years. And then it had to be voted on again to continue. But yes. Well, the reason I brought that up, not, not to see the list tonight, but my, as far as holding you accountable and, and it being transparent, Absolutely. is that that list could be somehow put on your website, publicly discredited, and we'd be given an update as those projects are yeah, that's a good way to check the balance there. Absolutely. One good example of what he's what he talked about. Last summer, on the BB Haskell, the road I live on, we paid twice. Was that here? What road is that? Painted Road in Rock Road. What kind of official lives on that road? <laughs> which, is, which, which is a subject that I need to discuss with you in private. <laughs> okay, so here's the neat thing about the splash. We can use that as matching funds, but the state will continue to send us about a million dollars plus a year going forward. So the two million dollars that we've got won't stop. We'll get a million dollars, we'll be able to take our matching money of about two and a half million and use that. Well, how far will that go? If asphalt prices stay consistent, labor stays consistent, general round number, you can resurface on average a mile of road for $100,000. So if you got $2 million, you can do about 20 miles. If you got $3 million, you can do 30 miles. As Dean mentioned a while ago, in the, in the other splash, they bonded out until there was $9.1 .1 million in there for road paving earmarked designated funds that we all voted on. They took that $9.1 million, publicly have admitted multiple times, they spent it on the industrial park to finish the industrial park. We lost a 70% match. The way this works is an example. If you're going to do a million dollar paving project, the state will give, as a gift, $700,000 of that, we put in $300,000. It's like your 401k. Where can you get a 70% return on your money day one? <coughs> I don't know anywhere else you can. The previous administration blew that opportunity on $9 million. $9.1 million. That would have turned into about $15.5 million. We could have paved over five, six year splice, 155 miles of road, rough estimate. But it's gone. So, I've got, part of the job that I have as being the commissioner now, is I've got to earn back the trust to this office. And we work on that every single day. 
is the trust. Yes, sir. I'd like to uh, answer this fellow's question right here about how a real man would trust you. And I've known this man since he was about knee high. He was my neighbor. What he said to me to do because if you, if you wanted to see, if you wanted to try this person, you should have been at the board meetings for the water authority. Now you've been to a couple of those. Yeah. He worked, well, he worked wonders there. We're still in trouble. Still in trouble. The things that this man, this is why I did. You should have just been there. I don't think and when you come, and if I can be very candid, when you come to that meeting, you were there originally because you had a problem which was legitimate, and you were not happy. And I had that problem for about over five years. We're working on getting it solved. Yeah, we're all sewage. All sewage was running out of the manhole at the end of my street, which would be on well, the street I used to live on. This kid, I was having to walk all those dogs down the street, which he died like what guts. Uh, and this raw sewage was literally running in my neighbor's yard and then going on down the road and going in the creek. And that's something he had every right to be very upset about. And I, I said to that the prior board and did to him and complained and oh well we'll take we'll, we'll, we'll do something about that. What they did, they just come out there and clean up the raw sewage. That was what was left. And so I brought this up about it, and when I was down at the, uh, they said they would look into it, and uh, he said he'd look into it. And about two weeks later, I went into the, to the office to get my landscape and my regular sewage uh, built so I could have the the banks and the checks. And Frida asked me, said, Tom said, did uh, they ever take care of your problem? I said, no, not yet. And she said, well, we, I, I'm going to put a note on our new managers. Uh, our new managers, after he had fired the old one, uh, I'm going to put it on his desk and said, I'll guarantee you, he'll take care of it. Well, about two days after that, we were, we were early in the morning. We were waking by something. We didn't know what it was. <laughs> Awfully sucking sound I've heard in my life. And my wife said, what is that? I said, I don't know. And I went in the bathroom. And all the water was sucked out of both of the commodities. And I said, well, and I looked down there, and they were down there working. And they corrected the problem because the sewage line was about half full of rocks. And then all the bunch of water it was picking up, but I don't know. But Got a lot of infiltration up. problems. We're working through this. We're but, moving forward. But and when I got done in, in I guess maybe two months, what I've been trying to get done, or been trying to get done for plus over five months. So that's why I'm on the vouch for this business now. That's what we need. just like I said, I know I'm not getting mad at them. Just like I said, we need a business person running the largest company in the United States, the U.S. government. We have it both places. Yes, sir. So you've uh, talked a little bit about roads, still have a big budget on operations, and it's still up and running. Uh, have you thought of ways to draw in more income besides a special tax? Uh, Retail, other business, industry, etc. That could bring both employment and yeah. Good question. What are we doing for economic growth? Yeah. The uh, Canyon Ridge Golf Resort that's being built moving forward will help us tremendously, but that's probably two, two and a half years of being built. What about you know, Calvin Station? What? Calvin Station. Calvin Station is a great development. They've got quite a few houses in there. I don't know if they've got anything currently under construction. But we need sales tax money coming in. Mm -hmm. And also, we need more jobs. Because we've got a large group of our population that's had to leave the county to get a job. 
get a decent paying, livable wage job. We were working on economic development every day. I can't give you all the details because of confidentiality, but we've got two companies I'll give you an example of on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, 1 being the lowest. We've got one out of country, from out of states looking at the Rock Springs Industrial Park. They've created a pretty good number of jobs, pretty sizable investment. On a 1 to 10, I'd say they're about a 2. They're still kicking tires, still looking around, still trying to figure it out. We've got another company that's looking to come to Walker County. And to get assistance from the state to help bring companies in, primarily to get the governor's office's attention, you've got to be 500 plus jobs, new net jobs for the state that are going to create. 500 plus good paying full-time jobs. Let me put it simply this way. We have the governor's office's attention in a big way. They're on about a scale of about an eight. And they would have a significant impact on our community. It could still fall apart. I put Canyon Ridge Project. They're going to employ 180 people, $22 million in revenue projection. That was probably about a nine, nine and a half. You say, well, I thought that was going forward. Well, it is, but if you could, could predict the economy and North Korea and all this other crazy stuff, I could tell you whether or not that project would ever get finished or not. If we end up in World War III, you'll probably see a lot of projects be put to halt. Or if the economy goes bad, the stock market drops, whatever. So it's, it's like carrying a sack of eggs uphill. You could fall, but you hopefully will get there. So this pro project will hopefully get there. Uh, there's an article in the Chattanooga.com last week where they fired two professional pro golfers that are architect designers for golf courses, and they're already going to work on the redesign of the golf course. That will be an ultra-luxury, high-end luxury <coughs> resort. And you say, well, I'm not going to be able to go there. No, but rich people will. <laughs> and I wish I could go up there every day and hug everyone on the neck. And say, welcome to Walker County. I hope you have a blast. Because when wealthy people spend money, they spend a lot of it, and they're going to leave it behind. And we're going to get the alcohol tax, the sales tax, the hotel motel tax. We're going to get all of that. <coughs> so I'm going to love every one of them. Yeah, three, five. Oh, that's a good point. Talking about our fire coverage on that section up there, we're a three Y up there, which means we don't have a fire station within five miles. It's going to affect the residents up there so much with this half million dollar homes, it's going to rake their insurance up two or three thousand dollars a year unless there's a fire station. They're going to build a fire station up there and donate it to Walker County. That's how serious they are about that development. It will be a destination. It'll have three or four restaurants, three or four swimming pools, a complete day spa, average room rates over $200 a night. It's going to be a destination. It's not going to be like you're staying at the Chattanooga, which is a great facility, or the Trade Center. It'll be a Trade Center, Convention Center. Uh, I forget how many rooms, 230 or something. But it will be a destination. They want people to come there and stay and leave their money behind. How much, how much money, county money, is going into all that? Zero. Every time we met with them, we said, we've got no money, we're signing no bonds. This is a project by another developer that tried it a few years ago. I've got copies of the documents where the prior administration was going <coughs> to co-sign for $50 million. <laughs> Folks, this is going to be a great project, but it's a high, high risk project. I've heard this before for long <laughs> they, they could build it. It's a hundred plus million dollar project. They could build it and it could still fail. So the question's been asked. One person said not if it fails, but when it fails. They may be right. How much does the county lose? We don't lose anything other than the sales tax and the hotel tax or whatever for volume goes down. The abatements on the back end are driven based off their performance. Everything the state's given them is based off of a sales tax reimbursement. 
If they don't make any sales, the state doesn't give them anything. If they don't spend a $100 million investment and employ 180 people <coughs> working 35 hours a week or more, they don't get anything from the county. So every meeting we would go and say, now you do realize we're not co-signing for anything. We're not giving you anything. We're not going to clear the land. We're not going to build the road. We're not doing anything. And it finally got calm. And the top developer said, look, let me we know that. Quit bringing that up. He said, because here's the problem we got. If y'all were to be a part of any bonding or lending or anything that we're going to do, and you lay your balance sheet on the table, you just hurt us. Because we've looked at your balance sheet. <laughs> I said, that makes me feel better. Because you're right. It would hurt the deal. It would rate them up. They said, we do not need you at the table when it comes to the funding of this or anything to do with the financing of this. This is not a government-private partnership. This is a private venture. Because we don't have any money or anything to, to help them. And they know that. So, back to your comment about our language. What do we do? One thing, since I've been in this position, I normally stay pretty calm and cool and leveled out, pretty mellow out. Don't get excited a whole lot, you know, as far as nervous or anxious. Or, and it's seldom ever lose sleep. Just the way God's wired me. Thankfully. My first week on the job was very stressful. Extremely stressful. Because not only was we trying to figure out the finances, and I didn't know if I was going to call the governor's office right then, everybody wanted to see the commissioner the first week. You know, it just drove me crazy. And, you know, I couldn't find anything. You know, they'd show me where the bathroom was, okay? I mean, it was crazy. That first week was stressful. The second most stressful week was last week. Because I had been wrestling, what do we do about Erlanger? And they're turning up the heat. Well, what do you mean to turn up the heat? They've told me in writing and in person, we're going to take enforcement action against Walker County unless you come up with a settlement that we will agree to. With their summary judgment, they have the authority and the ability to go before a federal court and get an order to increase our property taxes an additional seven meals. Wow. So, Somebody brought this up the other night. Basically, it would be over that number right there. We'd go here. And I would end up with a court order, and the tax commissioner and the assessor, everybody would probably be listed on there. They'd make sure they didn't leave nobody out. And we would all be under a federal order to make it happen. Miss Walker would probably have to deliver the check to them personally. To get them that money. What would they do if they might refuse to pay those taxes? So how do you suck to get that? <laughs> That's it. How would how you need thoughts of solving the current circumstances? Our very first meeting of this, when we talked about this last Thursday, we had quite a bit of discussion from the floor about how do we solve this because we don't have the money in the current budget. We still got to cut it for me, and what do we do? They have a court date set for the first week of September, folks, to go back to federal court. So, so typically when power and money are in play, you have to be equal that match, right? And the only thing you have going for you is people. Not the only thing, but so have you organized? Have you maybe we got a, a marathon race coming through the predominantly through Walker County? There's an opportunity to get some you know, list the board members of Erlanger, let people see the names of the people forcing it. I mean, that's the advantage you have. You don't have capital, you don't have... There, there are a lot of tools and ideas like that. Yes. But I'm a one-man show. Well, why don't you I've been running as hard as he... So I need y'all to come to things like this. Yeah, we need people like you to step up. Yes, Chad, have you considered professional mediation? We've met with them three times with professionals in the room. Attorneys in the room. I made them one offer of a half a million dollars every three months and they turned it down. 
Once so, again, bunch of iron peed up for them and have them put a spin on it. They, the last administration did that and only made it worse. Waterhouse out of Chattanooga, they did that, tried to smear Erlanger. But here's the problem. They're right. Erlanger is correct. Yeah. We owe the money. They've got the judgments. We owe it. So out of our first meeting and every other meeting that we've had, we've talked about how do we tackle this? How do we make this go away? How do we increase revenues to make this happen? We're all in this together. There's not a good solution. Like I say, last week was a horrible, horrible week for me. I lost sleep trying to figure this out. I still don't know if we got it figured out, but we got to do something because they're serious about this. So, people suggested will tax, all these other things that we can't do. I got a couple of three options. One, we could ignore it. I could sit by, play the cool politician, let Earl Anger do all the dirty work, and then I could blame it on the CEO and say, I didn't raise your taxes, Mr. Speaker did. Just let it play out. I could go to the banks, try to negotiate it, try to get more money, get another tan, go borrow from Peter to pay Paul, that note's going to come due every December 30th because these tans had to be paid back every December. You know, or we could start talking, I guess there's I didn't think about this, there's another option. We could just start shutting down county services. You know, we could all talk about which ones are least important because they're all important to somebody. We wouldn't have them. I've been taking a beating over just your roadsides not getting mowed early enough. And it's a real compliance, real issue. What about if we just quit mowing all together? That saves seven hundred thousand dollars a year. I've looked at it. Just in personnel, they don't count fuel or tractors or maintenance or anything. Just personnel, seven hundred thousand dollars for twelve million benefits. I mean, we could cut some stuff out, but I'd have to cut another four million. I've already got four to cut just to get them their four million a year. Y'all would not like what your government looks like at all because there wouldn't be much left. So we started talking about what other fees, what other ideas. One of the suggestions was, hey, if everybody in the county, there's almost 68, 69,000 people in the county, if everybody paid $100 per person, we could raise the money that way. But how are we going to know how many is in everybody's household? There's not a database, there's not a means to know there's one in your household, five, six, but there's no way to know. Well, U.S. Census data, well, it's a moving target, we don't have access to it. You know, how do we, how do, we do that? Some people say, well, we're all in this together, let's just divide it out by the number of partials. Everybody pays an equal share. Somebody did the math, they said, that's about $133 per partial. Partials track of land or your lot or whatever. Well, we got to looking at that idea. So we might be on something here. But I got to looking, some of these partials are not even valued $2,000. Their taxes are less than two bucks a year. There's a lot of lots, $10,000, $15,000. Their taxes are not $100. Like I said, well, I'll go about 90% of all the properties total value for each property, 90% of them is $200,000 or less. So we've wrestled with this, we've wrestled with this, we've wrestled with this. How do we come up with this money? So I made another offer to Erlanger today. Tyler, I made another offer to Erlanger today. I offered them $625,000 per quarter for 12 months, 12, 12 quarters, three years. $625,000 every quarter for 12 quarters, paid off in three years. An hour and one minute they turned it down. That had been seven and a half million dollars. They turned it down. It reminded me of the court date in September. I'm not bluffing, folks. This is real. 
They want a million dollars a quarter. They want all their money. They want $8.7 million. So, regretfully, here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to put a, a fee structure. We're going to create another fee. Just like your fire public safety fee. It's going to have a flat rate of a point. 1.4%. So when you convert that to a decimal, that's a point zero zero one four. So that's letter, less than a quarter of 1%. Okay? This is assessed value. This should be market value. We, we've done a typo of this. It should be market value. With a $1,000 cap. Nobody will pay on any property more than $1,000. This should generate at least $2.5 million a year to pay our own. We don't know exactly what it's going to bring, but we know it should bring at least $2.5 million a year. This will be applied this year on this year's tax bill. So here are some examples, and this will float based off this number. If you've got a value of $25,000, you'll pay $35. Bucks. $100,000 be $40, $140,000. So you know, if you're in between $75 and $100,000, you know, it's going to be an odd number. These are just some examples to show you. This is appraised value. No, you said market, market value. Market value. Market value. Which is done by the appraisal or, or the assessor's right. office. Right. But this is your top number. 100% of your fair market value is the proper term. 100% of your fair market value. That's before you 40% off. That's correct. That's before you take the 40% off. So. I've had the Association of County Commissioners working with me on this. I've had their legal team involved. We've got the documentation. It's on the agenda tonight to pull the trigger to make this happen. Folks, I'm out of time. I'm out of resources. I'm out of money. We, have, we, we know of no other option of how to do this to make this fair, equitable, to do what we can do. This will terminate December 31st, 2019. And this is on top of what we're already talking about. Yes, sir. Should we rename this the Verlanger? Oh. Let's call it the uh, BB tax. Yes. <laughs> I've done nothing. We should, yeah. because it's her fault. Well, legally, on your tax bill, I've got a more sophisticated <laughs> term we have to use, but for a, 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 a nickname, that's probably a pretty good yeah. list. <laughs> so, Mr. McCauley and several of you in this, I say several, there's three or four of you in your room have been to some of my other meetings this year, or this last couple of weeks, and they can vouch for me. Well, and Miss Walker's been to all but one. She's got her husband to come to the other one, I think. She can vouch for you. We've talked something about this in some form or fashion at every single meeting, trying to figure this out. But here's the problem that I've got. I've got to execute the documents today on the millage rate, on the public safety, and this, because Miss Walker has got to get the tax digest from the assessors, and Miss Walker has got to get down to the state as quick as she can to get the digest approved, so we can get the bills out by October 1st, so we can get money coming in as quick as we can, because we've got an $8 million loan that has to be paid back by December 31st. Let me tell you all what Christmas looks like to me this year. Yeah. A good Christmas for me this year is if we can pay those tans off before I have to eat Christmas dinner. And it's real. I don't want to be sitting there at Christmas wondering if enough tax dollars are going to come in before the end of the year to pay the tans back to the two banks. So another request I have of you and all the citizens of Walker County, mm -hmm. those of you that's taxes are not escrowed, once you get your tax bill, and you cannot do it not one day before because they can't legally take your money, but once you get your tax bill in hand, you can go to either tax office and pay that bill as soon as possible after the bill comes to you. The sooner we get that money, we can start making 
weekly payments or bi-weekly payments to the banks, we're going to save an interest. It's going to show that we're serious about repaying our debt. And every day we can take off of there, we can save, and hopefully we can all have a Christmas, we can say the county got the tan paid off. Now what's going to happen next year? Our predictions on our cash flow. We've already done a cash flow through 2018. Our predictions, conservatively, we had to borrow $8 million this year, starting in January. Next year, we plan and project we won't have to borrow any money until June, which is six months better than we are currently. Mm -hmm. And we're projecting we're only going to have to borrow $6 million because of cost savings and cash flow. The prior administration borrowed $5 million last year. They paid $255,000 in fees up front, plus 4.5% interest. Well, 4.5% interest sounds like a pretty good deal to the average common folk, but in government, that's about 3% higher than what everybody else is paying. So it's rated up. So they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. People say, well, what's really a TAN? It's a tax anticipation note. Look at it this way. It's payday lending for government. That's what it is. Government's the only ones that can do a TAN. They have to pay it back at payday. When's payday? December 20th. It's when the taxes are due. They give you 10, 11 days grace period. Payday lending for government. It's hard to get off that cycle. It's an addiction. And what most counties do, and what this county's done, most years or every other year, they go get a little bit more. Get a little more dependent. Go get a little more, a little more, a little more. There's another county very close to us that's done that, fell into that same trap. We've got to break that cycle. We've got to break that addiction and get off the crack cocaine for government money. Because it's 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 expensive. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I was going to ask really one quick question: How many homeowners are behind on property taxes? Because I called on an investment property, and this lady that was selling her home was behind by it was like five years, and I thought that that was kind of a lengthy time to be behind. Do you know? I don't know. I don't have that database that somebody Is it significant? I think the overall tax collection is over 90 what? 99.8. 99.8%. We do have bankruptcy people that are seven years behind and I can't touch them. So if right. something in bankruptcy, right. they can't touch them. Okay. Yes, sir, Dave. Well, a couple of points. You got, you got a moment. Sure. Uh, number one is, you know, it appears that all this kind of works together hand in hand. I mean, the dish wash is fundamentally meant to take the stress off the general fund and the payment of roads. So if the T-splash does not pass, that's going to jeopardize your way you know, perfect. No, because this will be designated money. Since this is a fee, this money will go into a separate account. This money will have to be used to pay off debt with. We can't use this for road paving. We can't use it for general operations. It has to be done here. If T-splash doesn't pass, <coughs> There's, there's a risk. Anytime you have a vote, there's a risk. If T splash doesn't pass, I will, can sit here and tell you we won't be able to pay roads for at least two years at all. Period. We won't have money. Well, second of all, uh, I, and I, I know this is probably illegal to do, but maybe so it could be done through the legislature. Well, these additional taxes that are being paid, people who do not escrow, that's a lot of money for them to have to come up with at one time at the end of the year during the holidays. Mm -hmm. Could there be a system set up where people could perhaps? Pay it quarterly or something like that during during the year. What's the current law, Miss Walker? They can't pay any in advance of the bill, but as soon as the bill goes out, we can let them pay. If they pay their whole bill in three payments, October, November, December, there's no fees, interest, or anything. After December 20th, there is interest, and in the past, it's been one percent a month. They've changed it a little bit so that the first three or four months it's not quite that bad. But then the fee after 60 days, it starts, it's 10 percent and keeps going. So is that county ordinance or state law? That's state law. 
We can't do anything any different to that. So like you say, it might be something through the legislation to change it. They go in session February, March? They just changed it this past year to reduce the interest from 12% a year down to that a little bit. Maybe there's, maybe there's some loophole around it. Maybe they can send it to your office. <laughs> Talking about sending things to my office. Good, good lead in for me. I've got some people that I've talked to about this, and even some people that saw this as kind of building some of the other presentations. If you have the financial ability and you want to help your accountant, we can accept your payment here for all three years in the up front. I know everybody can't do that. Or if you want to pay two years. Or a year and a half, whatever. You can't do it at the tax office. I've already got a list of names of people that told me they would do this. You'd have to handle it here. We'd get your receipt, make your copies, get it all documented where you've got that security. If it ever comes back or something happens, I get hit by a bus. You can say, I've paid mine. We'll scan that, send that to the assessor's office. They will take that documentation and attach it in their system under your property. Log that in the system, put a note in there, and take that line out off your taxes and show it paid in full so the next two years it won't show up on your bill. Yes, ma'am. Just that? Can we do the, the fire bill as well? Uh, we wouldn't want to do that one. That, that could kind of mess us up. If we could do this, this fee structure here on this new one, if people think it would be willing to do that. Yes, Ms. Walker? If they wanted to pay it as soon as the bills, the digest was approved, the bills were approved to keep it from being on their escrow, we could accept it that way. The, once it's billed. Yeah. Once the it's fire. Billed. The fire, anything, you, any amount you wanted to you pay. It's on that current bill. She, can't, the current take, bill. she can't take future money. No. I can do that here, we've determined, working with the assessor's office. No, we can do that here and document but by law, she's very restricted what she can, can do and stay on the line. As soon as they get the bill, come over. Yeah, and in, in fact, usually we have it on the website a few days before it's received in the mail, and and you could pay what would, would have cost your escrow to go up. Okay. Yes, sir. So this will be included on our regular tax. Yes, sir. <laughs> but it will come off if you pay it in a lump. Yeah, you can pay it in a lump sum, or once it runs for three years, it all have to come off for everybody. Yes, sir. Uh, the the uh, fire assessment, yes, that's a permanent issue. Yes, sir. That's not a tax bill. That's been on the tax bill since 1994. Yeah, she was saying pay it ahead. It really is. No, you don't want to pay it ahead. No, just this one. This one is possible to come in five years. Maybe get y'all to stay with us, please. Maybe get y'all's attention again, please. This gentleman has the floor here, please. Yes, sir. Based on, I know you have to run all the cash flow and all the analysis now. But just trajectory of where you're heading, the direction that we have, balancing the budget this year, these additional taxes. When do you think? we're going to get to the place that we've got a surplus that's going to be acceptable and reasonable for our county. And then we're going to be able to look at it and feel like we're where we need to be financially. I would love to have this county out of debt for 10 years. 10 years. I, I think if you try to do it any faster, it'd break us all. We're on the pace right now It's going to be 20 plus. If, and the way I say that, I was looking at some numbers. I said, lady, not to me. Look at some stuff. If we can take our current debt load, figure out how to have the revenue, pay that in 10 years, we'd save $9.2 million in interest. That's a huge number. Yes, sir. I think we can grow ourselves up. We, we can't, can't, you got to think of how to do yeah. that. Growth is going to be very important and helpful. Absolutely. Also, spending your money in the county instead of going to Kentucky County. Right. The more conscious we can be about spending and buying, I know it's difficult. There's a lot of things we don't have yet. But the more conscientious we can be about spending money in the county, every dollar helps. Is this this is already um, 
I'll be signing this here in a few minutes. Is that in the packet? Yes, sir. The last part of the, the, part of the last two or three pages. Yes, sir. Any example of civil no value, so any credit that is civil no value will be charged a public safety fee based on square footage. Okay, we'll talk about the public safety fee again. It says no value. There's some circumstances now on some abandoned properties where there's structures still standing. Houses, commercial buildings, and mobile homes. What has happened in the past under the previous administration is that the assessors go out and say there's no value on the structure. Okay, we're talking fire. No value on the structure, they zero that out. The fire fee would go away. What we're saying is, and what the chief has been able to articulate and explain, those are some of the most risky. They're most likely to burn or somebody to set them on fire as arson. Right. Got one hanging. So all structures will be assessed the new public safety fee. That's going to bring in some more revenue. It's going to cover the cost when somebody goes and does an arson or catches on fire because of lightning. I mean, all kinds of things that can happen. I do understand. It's not all malicious. But those structures, and we're hoping that that will help motivate the property owners to do something about it. You know, to clear the land, sell it, whatever, so they can get out from under that $130 fee or whatever, you know, whatever it is going forward on the 10 cents. But whatever records they have of what the original structure square footage was, if it's a mobile home, it's a 900 square foot mobile home, they're going to get a $90 bill they've never gotten before. Because the previous administration didn't bill them. Yes, sir. Is there anything that we can do legally to force all these people that are living in our county, especially in the Flintstone area, because it's so close to Center Street, and still driving? I've never buying a uh, Georgia tag. I'm going to look into that. I don't know the solid answer to that. They have well, to say be you've got, you've got a resident in the state. You got 30 days to get a tag. But we've got some. They never get. We've got some rental properties and things up on the north end where they've been there for six months. They've not registered in Georgia and paid the taxes. I've got to check legally to see, but I'm hoping that maybe our County police can start working on that if that's legal. We got to check into that. Yes, ma'am. Looking at this, two questions. Looking at this, it appears that in reality, over what we usually pay as far as the credits, we're going to be paying about a half percent more on whatever we have. And then on top of that, is it going to be reassessed during these three years, or can we pretty well know if our house is a hundred thousand, it's going to be a hundred and forty for three years? Terry, can you help us on the reassessment question? Yeah, that depends on the market. Out property sale. We're we're holding right in the range now on residential properties where we should be at. There's not really a, a need at the moment for reassessment. The only thing that we're having issues with right now are uh, ag properties. Ag properties are selling for an unreal amount of money. Talking about agriculture. Yeah. And uh, so we're we're looking at something this year on those uh, for 2018. But uh, but the other part so far is holding its own. Uh, it just, it all depends on the market. Yeah. Well, uh, we're checking that every year or so. Is, is it not a law that you have to reassess property every so often? Well, we have to uh, review the properties every other year. Perhaps we don't review them. The reassessment <laughs> part, that is influenced by the market success. <coughs> when you, we run ratio studies and out of range of a ratio study, then that's when you do the reassessment. But right now, as far as residential and commercial industrial, we're, we're in a good range. Well, we should be at. But like I said, the ag, the ag is making us nervous right now. It's all regulated by the state based off those ratios, and they have to report that information. So it's a pretty complex system. Folks, I mentioned y'all that I've labored over this. Because this was part of our inheritance that was passed to us because the previous administration never stopped and figured out a way to pay for this or deal with this. They only threw hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees trying to avoid it and keep the can down the road to get past the election and figure, well, we'll either deal with it after the election or whoever wins will deal with it. So this is part of our inheritance. This is the least painful way 
I mean, if, if our language would say, hey, we'll let this pay out in five, ten years, whatever, we could have we could have lowered these numbers or something. But this right here, I was hoping today that we'd accept my offer and this would work. Yes, sir. When we get our tax bill, how is it going to be communicated to John Doe's citizen what Walker County Public Health Facilities and Service District is actually talking about? Because most people are not right. having a clue. You're right. And there's going to be a lot of surprise people, I know. We're going to insert a letter this year into the tax bill, which was an option that Ms. Walker made known to me. I didn't know it was available, so she told me the, the mailing company we work with charges just a few pennies per piece. So we'll generate the letter, they'll print them, fold them, stuff them into the tax bill to allow us the ability to insert that letter to try to explain some of this and explain the public safety fee change and explain what this is about. And then we're going to put more information on our website and Facebook. On the Judy show, she'll have me back. <laughs> <laughs> if any of y'all watched last night, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But, uh, well, you know, we're going to have to try to get in front of it the best we can. Yes, sir. Could this not be billed separately? Well, see, I'm on escrow. It could, but it costs us several thousand dollars to do it. No, see, I'm, I'm sitting here. I mean. But like Ms. Walker said, you can't. Five, five years ago. Say $400 a month. I just had 150 saved last year off my taxes. And guess what? I'm a hundred dollars over all that already back because of taxes in the past. Now all of this, and I'm retired and basically disabled to work a lot now. Okay, because the leg and knee condition. That's an escrow. They don't just take out what. Yeah, it's, more, it's over a hundred percent over the average. And I'm looking at right now just at the fees and this. My escrow is going to increase about in the past what they've done. I'm looking at a hundred dollars a month because they, I know it was a smart answer come back to me on a previous administration. I've been at a lot of meetings, and I wish this. Yeah, hey, me, me and both. both. Me and you both. You uh, have a lot of them. We wouldn't be sitting here if I really got to the boss. But that's that's in the past. But man, it is killing me. I, you know, I've gotten from, and I appreciate what you're doing. I and, and I supported you. Thank you. And this is killing me. I, I'm looking at because <laughs> I got two problems. This is not meant to be a manual. I'm one of those that uh, has attained a few more years than some other people in here. So consequently, I have benefited from a slight reduction in taxes. This does not, this is not impacted. That fee is not impacted by age or no income, right? Yeah, there's no exemption. That's what I mean. And, I, and, and, and I'm pointing it out, not as a negative, but from the standpoint of the expectation of the people that are here in this economy. Yeah. So here's, here's what Mr. Baker's talking about. It's a solid point. If I had hit the reset button and said, look, two meals is not going to cut it. We're not going to have enough money. And I do have the authority to do that. I could have put everything on hold. We could have republished everything in the newspaper. We could have done three more public meetings, and it would have delayed everything at least three weeks, maybe four, which would have probably got the tax bills out late, so we've been further in line with the system getting it out. And we could have gone up another two or three meals. And then everybody that's got exemptions would pay really not a share of the pie, or maybe not any at all. There's some people that are completely 100% exempt they wouldn't have paid anything unless they made a donation. So with this, this is as fair as we can get because there's no exemptions. So that helped drive the numbers down. Yes, sir. If you pay that in a month, and next year your property value went up. Then you're paid. We're not going to go back. You sure. 
deposit. Okay. It's, that's a good question. If somebody pays this up front, if you're going to take the risk and pay up front, and your property value doubles, you've already paid. So if we pay three years, at our three years. Yeah, if you want to pay your three years up front. Now there's risk on both sides. Economy could take, your property value could go down. It's likelihood it won't. It's more likely that it could go up. But those of you that can pay it up front would be very helpful. Yes, sir. Is it coming on here? Is it getting? So on your tax bill, is tax deductible, yes, right? It, yes, I didn't say 10 years after retirement. Yes, it is. It is. I mean, I'm getting a lot of head nods. Yes. If it's on your tax statement, it would be deductible. Yes, ma'am, over here. Is Walker County finding an increase in population yearly or a decrease? And how will this, what do you project that's going to, how it's going to affect us? We've had a little bit of an increase, to my understanding. If you look around, there's quite a bit of new home construction, believe it or not, in Walker County. There was one of my critics on Facebook last week that said they were going to move out of Walker County. And so they said they contacted a realtor. And they said Walker County right now is a hot market and that it is a seller's market because things are selling fast. It was low inventory. So there's people trying to move into this area. And so when you look around at some of these subdivisions that have been dormant after the recession, you're starting to see some activity and some building. And one thing we're going to start adding on our sheet, we're going to start logging if we get the data, uh, building permits each month. And we'll start being able to show that on our analysis that we publish every month of how much building permit activity there is. Because I'm one of those as well. You could, you, you could slowly increase the permit charges on everything because those things are just added into the sale. We're fixing to raise those too. Talking about building permits and things, we're going to tweak that up a little bit too. Yes, sir. I know we've been here all the time, but I'm looking for a bright spot, and I do see. Like the, the industry we're talking about for eight and a half on the scale of 10. Well, when you think about it, from an economic development standpoint, and any job you think, I can't really say. I know, but I can't okay. say. Okay, okay. Well, let's say it's 300. Well, well, so, I, was, I said the governor gets excited at 500. Okay. We're over that. Okay. All right. like that. For, for every job in that sector, it usually drives an addition in the number of opportunities in the service market, whether it be a hairdresser or, or, the, or, or the tire shop or whatever. Right. Okay, and so there's more sales tax revenue, even, even if that person uh, doesn't live in this county, there's still an impact in a retail situation. And I think back to the time that before Walmart was in the Fed, Bill Chapin at Rock City was the highest paying uh, uh, tax entity in Walker County. And he's not anymore. But we need more retail. And this could not run out of something. In, in industry jobs, manufacturing will draw more retail, draw more growth, right. maintain our values. Cleaning up our county will drive. Uh, call your attention to the packet that you've got. We'll start getting into this here in just a moment. But I'll show this. The very last page you've got talks about our statistical data. And if you look at litter detail, halfway down, it's your very last page. This pack, litter detail. The month of June, we picked up 10,900 pounds of trash off South Road. One full-time county employee and three to four trustees. The month of July, they picked up 7,860 pounds. Year to date, we picked up almost 80,000 pounds of trash outside of our roads. This is a statistical report we're doing every month. It shows the most two current months, year to date, and a comparison to last year if we have the data. How many leaders you I hope there's some. Other questions? Okay. 
All right, let's take about a two or three minute break and then we're going to go. We're going to, this is going to end our public hearing. We're going to take about a two or three minute break while you stretch, go to the bathroom. And then we're going to reconvene for those of you who can stay and go into our official public commissioner's meeting. And we'll go through our agenda and this entire packet. Probably take us 20 minutes. So, hope you can stay with us.